Welcome to the regular December meeting of the Concord Zoning Board of Adjustment. We will follow our usual procedure this evening, which is to say we will take the cases in the order in which they appear on the agenda. I will ask the appellant to come forward and be sworn in and be seated in the chairs to my right and offer any testimony that he or she would like us to hear. We do request that if at all possible, you confine your testimony to a 10 minute interval. We will then ask the appellant to step down and we will solicit testimony from anyone who is in favor of the appeal and also anyone in the audience who is in opposition to it. We ask that those people please do their best to confine their testimony to a five minute interval. Following that, we will check in with code enforcement to see if there is anything from their office to add to the discussion. And then if anything has been raised that seems to bear factual clarification, the appellant will have the opportunity to offer that clarification, not new arguments, prior to our closing the public testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, under most circumstances, the board will act on each case before moving on to the next one. We have a very full inbox this evening, which is why we're starting at six instead of seven. So uh, brevity will be very much appreciated. I can't promise you that you will prevail if you are brief, but I can promise you it will do your case no damage. The first case that we have before us this evening is uh, 0003-2022, 5 Thomas Street. This is a recessed hearing, RH High Density Residential District, ZV Investments, LLC. The owner wishes to redesign the property and expand from three dwelling units to 10 dwelling units on site and request variances to the front yard setback to be reduced to nine and a half feet to accommodate the structure replacing the existing garage to the requirements for density of multifamily to allow 10 units rather than nine to article 28.405 D3 to allow separation of parking from primary structures to be seven feet as opposed to the required 15 feet and Article 2845D5 perimeter buffer requirements will be reduced to accommodate existing and proposed reconstructed buildings. Article 2877G1, five parking spaces will need to be located in the front yard. And to Article 2878A to allow 12 of the required parking spaces to back into the dead end street. Is there anyone here from 5 Thomas Street? Please come forward. Yeah. Swear to tell the truth and nothing but. Thank you, gentlemen. Would you identify yourselves for the record as you testify? I think we need to take this off the, uh, we need to reopen this case because it was mm -hmm. recessed. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Please proceed. Jeff Lewis from North Point Engineering. Uh, Dan Mark from ZD Investments. <clears throat> what would you like us to know? Um, so, quick introduction of myself. Uh, I've been in the area all my life uh, in this business for what seems like a hundred years, but two companies, Shanner Luxury Homes, and we do new construction, high-end homes. Uh, we've had the pleasure of building some beautiful properties for our clients and, uh, and have a reputation of doing some really nice product that always looks nice and benefits the neighborhoods. Um, ZV Investments, we do, uh, we look for older homes that are a little tired and in need of love, and we buy them, fix them up, and turn them into something special. And that's what brings us here tonight, uh, 5 Thomas Street. We looked at that property three years ago, recognized it for what it is, which is underutilized property in a, a mixed-use zoning. Um, which works perfect for what our, what, what we, I believe works perfectly for what we're trying to do with the property. Um, it's unique in that it's, you can see it up there where it's certainly in the mixed use zone, but it's unique because it's kind of tucked away in the corner and it's really set up ideally for a nice little single family uh, uh, and multi-family uh, street. Um, it's wooded on the, the uh, west side and kind of protected from the street. The neighbors have done a beautiful job on the street fixing their properties up. Um, and 5 Thomas Street 
interestingly, uh, has an enormous presence on the street. It's one of eight buildings, and yet it represents over 30% of the street frontage. Has a large, large presence. Um, we'd like to take advantage of that, turn it from what it is now, which I would call an eyesore, uh, and turn it into something beautiful, a landmark, um, and really enhance the neighborhood. Um, another piece of it was we, when we were doing our due diligence, we understood that the city was working on uh, their zoning regulations and looking to restructure them a bit. Uh, and we studied that and, and determined that it was, would likely uh, work in our benefit when they got the zoning uh, regs changed. Um, we met with all the heads of the departments two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, was pretty well received, very well received, and uh, so we said, okay, great, we'll, we'll hang in there. We were, it was indicated that the zoning changes might take uh, six to 12 months, I think, so here we are two and a half years later, um, and I think they're getting close, but we kind of reached the limit. We figured let's make a move and go see what we can do with this property. We met with the heads of the uh, departments again a few months ago. Uh, had another great meeting with them, and I would call it uh, very well received again what we were trying to do and what our vision was. Um, so that was encouraging, and that brings us here tonight. Uh, if we can go through a few slides, I'll just try to share our vision a little bit. So this one you can see, it's not outlined, but you can see the property there in, in Thomas Street. And you can see the amount of frontage that this property uh, represents on, on the street. Um, so it just, it does have an enormous presence, both on street frontage and the location of it, right on the corner uh, of Loudoun and, and Haven. Um, so it's an important property, and if we can do what we're envisioning doing, it will be a benefit to all. Uh, next slide, if you would. So there, you can't get onto Thomas from Loudon. You go around. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our vision uh, of what we'd like to do, and it would certainly be a game changer for Thomas Street in terms of, you know, just the the appeal and the the beauty of it. Uh, next slide, if you would. This is existing <coughs> garage structure. Um, that we need to do a lot of work with. We want to push this back, uh, get it off the street further. It encroaches on the property line to the north. We want to uh, move it over, lose one bay to accommodate that and make it conform. Uh, next slide, if you would. And this is what we'd like it to look like. There'll be two units, two single family units on the second floor of this structure. Next. This is the existing building, uh, looking uh, west, westward. Uh, that's what it looks like today. The next slide is what we want it to look like, like that. And that's, that's what we specialize in. Uh, next slide, if you would. Another view of it from the looking kind of northwest. And that's not a good angle of it, but that's what it would look like from that angle. I think there's one more maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, that's the overall look of it. That's our vision of what we're trying to do. I believe it will benefit all. Um, a nice thing, another nice thing about uh, Thomas Road, it's unique. It's a dead end street. Um, very little traffic, only residential, the, uh, the residents, uh, only traffic generated by the residents of Thomas Street and an occasional lost soul trying to figure out how to get back on Loudoun Road. Um, and that would be the same when we're done. It'll be just, it'll be a lovely neighborhood that most of the neighborhoods in Concord would envy uh, because it's dead end. It's virtually a, de a private road with city benefits. Um, and the traffic flow will be no, no more than the traffic generated by the residents of Thomas Street. So that's, that's a very positive uh, situation for us. Um, that kind of sums up my introduction to what we're trying to do, I think. Um, I don't know if I've skipped anything, Jeff, but if I have, I'll let you. Yeah. 
pick up on it. Sure, thanks. I'm just going to run through just kind of some things to add to that. Can you open up the second liner, Tracy? Mm -hmm. um, and just to, I guess, jump back a little bit, not to be too redundant because I don't want to save some time here, but um, Dan mentioned the, the neighborhood over there, and, and you asked about um, about the street. So Thomas Street is a short dead end street. It's accessed off of, accessed off of Pro, uh, Prospect Street, which is the street that's kind of parallel to Loudon Road right there. Uh, you have to go all the way out to the east to access uh, Orban Street over there. And this is the neighborhood that's right behind McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts um, and these houses that are back that you probably drive by many times a week and, and wouldn't know that there's a neighborhood back there. Um, I know there's some folks in the neighborhood here today who will who probably have some things to say. Um, the one area you do notice if you drive by there is this very end of Thomas Street and this, uh, this building and this house at 5 Thomas Street that, that Dan's uh, done a good job describing. Um, it is very much a mixed-use neighborhood right now. Um, there are some existing multifamily uh, buildings on Pr Prescott Street, um, a 24-unit, I think an 18-unit, and maybe a 6-unit. Uh, there's some duplex units out there, both on Thomas Street and on and on Prospect, Pres Pro sorry, Prospect Street. There's also a handful of single-family homes, uh, eight or ten single-family homes. So it's very much mixed-use residential right there, as well as obviously being right adjacent to the to the commercial area of Loudon Road. Um, and as as Dan mentioned, it's it's right on the intersection. I mean, this property is the intersection of Loudon Road and Hazen Drive, which is one of the busiest intersections in the city of Concord. However, it has one of the lowest traffic volumes because it's at the end of a dead end road, uh, which is Thomas Street, where the access is. Both Hazen Drive and Loudon Road are restricted uh, right away, so there is no opportunity to, co to connect to those. Um, if you want to go to the next one, it's again just zooming into the next. Um, and that just shows you again. We just talked about that, so maybe uh, head to the next the next slide. What I wanted to do is walk through um, the plan and why we're asking for this kind of slew of variances um, and how we how we came to them. Yeah, you can go to the. I'm trying. Oh, is there not one catching up with me. One before that, um, and as as Dan mentioned, he he approached us <laughs> almost three years ago with the with the idea that he wanted to do kind of a phased project here. His 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 thought at the time was he wanted to take that three unit building and convert it into six units, um, possibly add on to it to have eight units, uh, which he's allowed to do in the zoning right now. This is uh, high density residential. He's allowed 12 units per acre uh, in the current zoning ordinance. He only has three units on there. Uh, and he's about three, three quarters of an acre. So he's allowed to have up to nine units on the property. Um, so that wasn't a problem. Um, he, he also had the idea of adding those two units over the garage and kind of beautifying that garage, rebuilding it, pulling it back a little bit. As you can see, it's right on the front setback. It's, it's actually across the property line to the north, so he wants to pull that back, make it a little bit more conforming, and add a couple units on top of that, which would then take it from eight units to ten units. So it's when we go to that ten unit, uh, we're now over the allowed density, uh, which is nine, um, and he kind of held off on this for a while because we're fully expecting that uh, when the new zoning ordinance comes out, um, that this is the type of thing that this could be promoted in that. So he's really kind of held off moving forward, being very anxious for that to come out, and we're still waiting for phase two of the order. This is in the phase two section of the of the new ordinance, which has there's been nothing released on in in nearly three years. So. Um, so we are moving forward right now, um, asking for these variances, one of them being the density. Um, and I just wanted to point that out because he does have, you know, he is allowed to have nine units on the site right now. It's just trying to figure out how to do that because um, there are these other zoning uh, restrictions on the property. The first one is the buffer requirement for a multifamily residential uh, use. You're required to have bu perimeter buffers. Um, this is a three-story building existing. So it's required to have a 75 foot perimeter buffer. Um, the lot is 150 feet wide. So if you can just picture that, that's a, a 75 foot buffer around the perimeter of 150 foot lot leaves you with nothing. So there's no there's no ability to put this three this three story structure on this lot today. Uh, so we need that variance even just to convert and add a fourth unit to that existing building. He's going to need a variance because he doesn't have a, a buffer. Um, so that's one thing we looked at early on was, well, what can we do here with the buffer? You know, we have Loudon Road and we have Hazen Drive. There really isn't a need for uh, a buffer there. Um, we have, you know, an existing single family neighborhood across the street that he wants to be sensitive to. So what can we do? Can we enhance that buffer? What can we do? So we decided let's not add on to this building 
in the direction of Thomas Street. If we're doing anything, let's just try to add on to the, the sides of the building. So we looked at a couple of those options. And also, can we pull that garage back a little bit so that right now those spaces kind of back out of that garage right onto Thomas Street with not a lot of you know, sight distance right there. If you're backing out of that garage onto the street, you gotta get well into the street before you can even you know, see what's coming down the street. So uh, if we pull that back another 10 feet or so, it gives us a nice long driveway apron there. Um, and I think just provides a better you know, visual from the, for, the for the neighbors across the street. Um, you can see on that plan too, the rest of the parking is right in front of the building. They have that kind of looped driveway uh, with, the, with a, a, an outdoor parking in the front. Um, and what we want to do is kind of remove that and put it more to the back of the site. So we're pulling back some of the existing impact along the frontage and putting it more to the back of the site, which just allows them this opportunity to kind of beautify uh, the site. Uh, going along with obviously the renovations he wants to do to the building, um, trying to enhance the buffers that are there. So that's our first um, re request for variance is really just to allow us to work with the confines of this site and expand the building. If you want to go to the second or the next one, Tracy, um, that shows you what, we're, what we propose to do with the addition on the north end of the existing building, which would get him two additional units. So we'd be renovating the existing footprint to go from three units to six. Uh, the two units on the north end of the building would get us to eight, and then the two units, abo two units above the garage would get us to 10. Um, we'd have a driveway going to a parking lot in the back, um, and then some driveway. We, we're proposing to extend the, the kind of the turnaround of, at Thomas Street and make use of that area. That would take some, some negotiation with the city um, which we talked to them and approached them about, and they seem amenable to that, uh, to kind of extending the, the dead end T turnaround there to allow us to back out under the street there. That way, we wouldn't have to add any other parking in the front of the front of the building. We could really keep it keep it behind and to the side. Um, so I think this is our attempt at you know dealing with you know the buffers and the setbacks uh, that we have for the building and and trying to justify the request for that for that variance. Um, Flip through my notes here. So the second variance, let's see, that was minimum yard requirements. The second variance was maximum density, which I already uh, talked about. We're trying to go from nine to ten, um, which again is it's, cons it's that is consistent with the multifamily. If you were to look at the uh, existing multifamily uh, units in that neighborhood, they're well in excess of of the density that we have. Several of them. Um, so what we're proposing is really just to be won over the, the, the current requirement um, of nine. Is that based on the lot size? That's based on the lot size, the buildable lot area, right? So it's 12 units per acre. We have three quarters of an acre. So for example, one of the, um, just go through my notes, one of the multifamilies on uh, Prescott Street is three quarters of an acre and it has 24 units. So that's more than 12 of what we're proposing. So that's just, it's, you know, twice as dense on that, on that small lot. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, a whole lot of what we're asking for in terms of the density. Um, the next one, section 28.4.5.D3 is minimum building dimension separation. Again, this applies to multifamily units and there's a, uh, there's a requirement in that section that buildings be no closer than 40 feet to each other and that all buildings be a minimum of 15 feet away from parking lots. Um, so in this case, we, we identified this as a variance because where our driveway is coming through between the, the, the two buildings up there, we're within seven to eight feet of the driveway right there. Um, usually, we would be trying to keep that a 15-foot dimension. I mean, in this case, we're proposing curbed driveway. Um, there's no other real way to get back and make use of that area other than being within, within the 15 feet of that building. So. I think that you know normally when we look at that uh, requirement, we're thinking that they want some uh, land adjacent to the building uh, for access and sidewalks and landscaping. And as you can see, we do have that everywhere else. We have 15 feet um, around most of the areas. Uh, what, really, what we're talking about is that that one area right there adjacent to the building addition, and then with, where we're pulling the garage back off the front property line. We're now getting a little closer than 15 feet to that parking in the back. We're closer to, uh, to 10 or 12 feet in the back there. So um, this is really just uh, kind of a variance for the, to, to fit it, to fit this stuff into that lot. 
um, and, and still have a two-way driveway and, and not be asking. But the other thing we could do is ask for variances on you know, parking spaces or, or size of spaces or something like that. We felt like this is an appropriate layout and we didn't really need to have that 15-foot uh, distance. Um, perimeter buffer I talked about. Oh, I got these out of order a little bit. Um, minimum yard requirement is one of the variances. That, that speaks specifically to that garage where um, the existing garage was across the property line to the north and it's sitting right on the front property line. We do have a 15 foot front yard setback here, however, um, and we're only proposing that front building to be, that front garage to be nine and a half feet from the front property line. Um, again, we're trying to distance that so we have room for the parking space in the back. Uh, so we are going from a zero foot setback right now to pulling it back to nine and a half feet. So we're, you know, we're, we're decreasing the nonconformity that's there. Um, we're pulling it 10 feet away from the, the side yard setback, so we are honoring that. Um, and we're basically just rebuilding that garage, uh, but we're obviously adding, want to add to two units on the top. So that's kind of the ask there, is allow us to, to pull that garage back, make it so it's better conforming, um, make it a better looking structure, uh, but we still still do need to uh, encroach into that, into that front setback a little bit. Um, and the other two, uh, variances are related to, to, to parking, not, not the number of parking spaces, but there is a restriction, uh, 2877 G1, uh, for multifamily use that says you can't have parking spaces within the front yard setback. Um, again, on this site, it's an existing multifamily use, and those garage spaces are parking spaces, and they are located in the front yard setback. Um, we're proposing to pull those garage spaces back a little bit, but they'll still be within the front yard setback even though less so, um, but it is a new building, uh, so there will be those five garage spaces that are partially located with a front yard setback. Um, so we identified that as needing a variance. Um, again, it's a, it's, we're making that situation less non-conforming, uh, so, and we think it's a reasonable use. Um, and then the last variance, 2878A, is restrictions on backing into a street. Again, this is specific to multifamily uses. As I mentioned before, we're not allowed to back into a street. Here we have two instances where we're doing that. One is those garage spaces, which are already there. Um, we're making them better by pulling them back, making them a little safer, but people will still need to back into the street to access those garage spaces. And then the new spaces we're putting down at the end of this dead end, um, those folks would also need to back out into the street. I think both of these are unique in that one of those is, is at the actual hammerhead of the, of the, of the uh, dead end, so there's really going to be no traffic there. Uh, so there really should be no safety issue about, about backing into the street. And obviously the existing garage is very close to the end of the street. It's an existing condition that we're making safer. Um, he could leave those five spaces there, leave that garage there, and you know, not build the two units above it and just keep the garage there and let five people park there. Uh, so this is certainly be a better situation. It's going to be a nicer building. It's going to be pulled further back from the road, so it will be safer. Um, and it is just the same five parking spaces. Um, I've probably taken much more time than the chair wanted me to. So that's a, that's the summary right there. Uh, we do have the criteria. I think that you know our, our biggest thing here is I think that the dimensional requirements. I, we feel like this is really an attempt to to make this a better a better property to a better functioning property. Um, it, certainly it can support the density we're proposing. Um, if, the not, if the 10 units is a, is a tough ask, you know, if that, then his intent right now is to uh, convert, the, convert the existing building so he goes from three units to six units. So we would need the rest of the variances in order to, really in order to do that, in order to add the parking spaces. He'd really like to rebuild that garage and add those two units there. And that would give him eight units that he's allowed to have. Um, if we get the variance for the, ten for the 10 units, then he would, as a third phase, kind of add on to the building. Um, if he doesn't get the variance for, the, for that third phase, then he may do that addition anyways and just have it a single family unit, uh, a one story rather than two story, because he's allowed to have nine units. Uh, he may wait to see how the zoning, the new zoning ordinance pans out. Um, I expect that he's gonna be allowed to have 14 or 15, 16 units in here. Uh, so he may just wait until then. But he would like to get moving on the, the renovations of the building so that he can get the extra units in there and have some direction on the, the garage and, and that, that aspect of it. So um, I know that you know, people would be concerned about density out here, so I, I just want to just focus on that, that we are allowed to have nine units out there. Um, 
and if, if that tenth unit is, is too much of an ask, you know, we understand that. Uh, but we just he, we wanted to come and propose to you what his full vision is for the property, um, and so that everyone, everyone knows. Yeah, and on that, the on that tenth unit, it, you know, I'd be willing to make it contingent on the zoning change as well, and uh, if it's approved, you know, and the zoning change does go in place and the density is increased, then, then then I would implement that. Tenth unit. So if that helps, you any. wouldn't need us if the zoning. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> What's that? You wouldn't need us if the zoning changed and allowed it. You wouldn't. You wouldn't need to come to us for relief. Under those right. Right. No. But if it was approved, I would. I wouldn't mind it being contingent on that. And then, then I could just go. Well, I guess I get. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Good point. <clears throat> Questions from the board. Andrew. I have a question. So you on the main unit where you're going from three to six. So I saw part of that is you're going to uh, finish the attic, but other than that, are you adding more space to the main building, or are you just making smaller units? Cause smaller it's units, correct. So you're just changing the layout. Yeah. Oh no, there's one section we're uh, putting a second floor story on the uh, south end. Okay. And yeah. how many of these ten total units? What? Wh how many bedrooms? I, mean, I don't know if it's said in there. I don't remember seeing how many total bed. Like, work. Like, what's the how many bedrooms are they, roughly? Um, ten, I believe. Ten. Ten units in ten bedrooms. So each one. one's one. Bedroom. No, no, in that unit, there'll be. Oh, oh in the main building. Six units. Was, was that what you're asking? The six. main building, yeah. Or just like how many of them are three bedrooms? How many are two bedrooms? How many? Before bedroom? two bedrooms and two single bedrooms in the main building. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I didn't yeah. phrase it very well, but yes. <laughs> um, I'm glad you recognize that the density is a big ask. Can you give us anything to hang our hardship hat on in terms of the density variance? Well, I could, I could say that, you know, I think when the last thing I said is, is, is really the truth there. This is his vision for the property. He'd like to, he'd like to, to do that. So um, we, we didn't, we're trying to not come, I guess, twice, you know. Um, but we recognize that that's you know maybe too much of an ask, and and so we wanted to the, to, to present the plan like this. I think what I think of that density from is is really um, uh, just the, the 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 neighborhood and what's out there right now, and that this is you know does jive with what's out there. We have multifamily units on this street that are that are much many more units you know and I, I there's concerns about you know traffic or anything like that we're talking about one multifamily residential unit um i think it the way that this lays out you know that that tenth unit is is what he's going for and i mean i really do believe that in you know he is going to be a situation where he, he he could get more if he wanted to if he waits and he's waited to the point where we, you just can't. So, I, no, I'm, you know, I, th I think I think that's it. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> Jim, did you have any questions? Is the current uh, three-unit um, dwelling set occupied now? It is, yes. Okay. Any questions? We're good. No? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Just step down. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone here who'd like to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition to it? It appears there are. <laughs> would uh, Would you care to come forward, at least one of you? Uh, well, let's look at it this way. If you're going to repeat what other people have said that's not particularly helpful. So if you've got something different to say from other people, then yes, come one at a time. If, if you're going to repeat what other people s have said, just uh, raise your hand and say, I agree with him. <laughs> and and we'll, we'll, we'll do it at that. You don't mind, do you? No, I don't mind. Thank you for coming back from last month. Thank you. We sat through yeah. a long meeting. You get pride of place tonight. It was sure. unfortunate, but we're here. You all swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. 
I do. As you testify, would you please identify yourselves for the record? My name is Mark Swinehart. I live at 12 Thomas Street. We've uh, lived there for my wife and I for about 37 years. Uh, it's a nice, quiet little dead end street, as I said. You're on Thomas. Yes, on Thomas. As a matter of fact, if I make, may I get up and approach yep, yep. the map? Yep. There. Are, Thomas Street comes up here, and we own uh, about an acre and three quarters up at the far end. Mm -hmm. Behind us is the state property. Uh, yes, this is my property. Yeah. Um, it's a nice, quiet neighborhood. There's seven single-family homes on the street. There are no, contrary to what you just heard, there are no multifamily units on Thomas Street except for this duplex and the property that's in question. On Prescott Street, up here are multi-units. There's nothing down here on uh, our street, on Thomas Street. It's uh, very, as they said in their application, very little traffic on the street. There's a, the most traffic that we get is walking because people coming from the apartment houses or over at Royal Gardens, Concord Gardens, walking down, instead of walking down Loudon, along the edge of Loudon Road, they'll come down Ormond, Prescott, and Thomas. That's the most traffic we get is people walking. And down at the end of uh, Thomas Street, where the hammerhead, the two hammerheads are, there's a bus stop there. So a lot of people will wait right on Thomas Street there for the bus. Uh, we get a lot of state employees walking by, coming from transportation and Department of uh, Safety, walking along there at lunchtime. Um, and uh, it's a nice, quiet little area. Um, exhibit A of the appeal implies that the applicant is resolving areas that are not currently in compliance and non-compliance. From me looking at the plans the, that we received from you folks, it looks like they're creating more areas of non-compliance. They're trying to go around in the buffer on all four sides, build in the buffer. Um, and the plans I got, the garage that was in question, which they were talking about moving back 10 feet, they're only moving it back less than two and a half feet. Uh, it's going from uh, 7.4, 7 feet 4 inches from the property line right now back to 9, 9 feet 6 inches. That's not moving it back 10 feet. So they're not solving any problem there. Um, one of the big concerns I have is, can you show the hammerhead down there? Yep. I don't mind getting up if that's allowed. Oh, that's no, fine. Okay. Just didn't know if it would be easier for you. As you can see, there's not much. Thomas Street's a relatively narrow street. During the winter time, the city of Concord fills this whole hammerhead up here and here with snow. They push. They actually put it in three different places: here, here, and on the front of my property. Uh, they come usually. Oh, well, depending on the winter, we usually count on them coming in with a bucket loader and big ten-wheeler trucks three, four times a winter and then they scoop it up and get ready for the next snowstorm. If they're gonna park cars here, there's not gonna be nearly the amount of room there. Generally, the only people that come, big trucks that come in once a week are on Friday, after, Friday morning when the city picks up the garbage. And I happened to notice last Friday, what they do is they come down the street, back in here, no, they pull in here, back up here, and then go back up. So you're going to, the applicant's asking to cut that off, pretty much, access to that, because their cars will be parking all the way out into encroaching on the hammerhead. Uh, so that was, I just wondered if general services had any, if they review these plans, uh, it's just a question of mine. Engineering uh, does. Engineering does? Yeah. Okay. That would be subsequent to any ruling that we made, but engineering would review them as part of the permitting process, as would the planning department. Okay. 
Uh, I don't think public works. And it will have to go to the planning board. Yes. Yeah. I don't think public works per se weighs in on it, but uh, engineering, I think, usually defends their interests. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the garages, I, I mentioned about moving them back. I don't see where it's moving them back 10 feet. But I'll tell you something. When I first purchased my home in 1985, I looked at those garages. They were for rent. You could rent one, two, three, whatever. And uh, I have too much junk, as my wife says. So I looked into running garages. And at that time, I did not rent it. I don't know what the situation is now. But there were a lot of 30-gallon and 55-gallon drums stored in there. And it smelled like oil or waste of some kind in there. And I said, no, I don't want to put anything in there. At the time, it was dirt. I believe it's been uh, sealed over now with asphalt or concrete. What I would be concerned about is if they're going to dig that up and build an another additional apartment house there, is that soil going to be remediated? Is they going to follow city guidelines or state guidelines if they're going to be exposing that soil and digging it up? And again, I'm not sure if this is something that you folks consider, but I don't know where, if they have 10 apartments on that site, it's going to up the residential on Thomas Street by almost 60%. It's like 58%, the number of housing units that will be on Thomas Street. So it's quite a big jump. Where are they going to put their dumpster, or are they going to have... 20 garbage cans sitting out there every week. I mean, I don't know if that's something that you consider. There Unless is no... If they're asking for a variance to place the dumpster somewhere, that wouldn't be part of our... Community. Okay. Well, if I was... It would be reviewed by the city. I would okay. I was concerned about... Because they're asking to utilize every bit of the space and buffer zone on all four sides, as I said. Uh, there's no place for playground for kids. I mean, if they have two-bedroom apartments, there's probably going to be kids there. These are just, uh, and again, I'm not sure if you folks take that into consideration or if it's your area. Um, in paragraph four, the applicant says the value of the subject property parcel will significantly increase, which in turn will raise the value of the adjacent property. I disagree with that strongly. This appeal of the variance seeks to put the maximum number of units on a very small three-quarter acre lot. He's seeking six variances and is creating more areas of non-compliance than he's resolving. He said it's a game changer. Yes, the applicant said it was a game changer. It would be a game changer for Thomas, for Thomas Street. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope I got the five minutes in. <laughs> I think you got your five minutes worth. <laughs> Who else would like to go? speak? Who wants to go? Well, mine was about traffic. Yep, May I? Find May we have your name, please? Oh, my name's Chilla. It's spelled C-S-I-L-L-A. Bowman, B-A-U-M-A-N. What would you like us to know, Ms. Bowman? Address. Our address is 8 Thomas Street. And we reside right on the corner of Prescott and uh, Thomas Street. So <clears throat> right now there's potentially well there's not potentially but everybody has two cars because that's just the way it is married couples there's you have two cars um, so or more so technically you know you have we already have nine families there so that's two times that that's 18 cars that drive by my house my corner on a daily basis one to three times a day or more so now we're asking this person's asking for a potential building that's going to house 10 families you know there's going to be two incomes, two cars per family, so that's 20 more cars. And he has, what is he asking for, Thir 30 parking spots? I counted 30 yeah, parking 30 spaces parking on spots. the property. I mean, 30 parking spots for, let's say, 20 people for 20 cars. That's a lot of traffic there. I don't know if you've ever been on Thomas Street. <laughs> it's not a very big road, and it's a dead-end street, exactly like he said. It's a very nice, quiet, dead-end street. And that's why we bought our home there, because it's a nice, dead-end street. There's no access to come from Loudoun or ha uh, Hazen Drive to that property. Would Concord consider maybe opening that up so they can leave and come back through Hazen Drive and Loudoun Road? 
I mean, there was a reason why that got cut down, right? That got shut off for Loudoun Road from Thomas Street, right? I mean, obviously, because you can't get out there. So why are we building a big place for more families to reside on that street? It's a very small street. I don't see the better for it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's, my property value won't go up. Who's gonna want a corner house that's constantly has a drive, cars driving by it? No one. I mean, I don't think so, but go ahead, Jeff. You go say what uh, Jeff saying. Bowman. I'm uh, Chilla's husband. We live at the corner house there. Um, ingress and egress is a big issue with a property like this. I understand that. We've already been here three times in the last 15 years for a property at 95 Loudon Road on the back of our property lines right here. Three different developers bought this property right here over the Mr. last 15 Mr. Bowman? years. Yes. We got a long night coming. Okay, Let's I'll be stick pleased. to this case, please. Okay. Some of the points I would use for that property would apply to this property. That's why I brought it up. They cross over. Okay? A lot of the problems that the board had with that property was ingress and egress, and that property is further out towards the exit onto Loudon Road and out of our neighborhood. That would be the back side of our property. This property is all the way at the furthest point in on the dead end of our street. The dead end starts out at Prescott and Ormond and comes all the way down and ends right there at Loudon Road. This property is proposed to be at the very end of the dead end. Therefore, every piece of, pro uh, every vehicle that comes in and out of that property is going to be, everybody's going to be affected that's outside of that property, that is on the outside. And that includes us, that includes Debbie, that includes the other two houses towards Loudon Road. Mark, there's two other property owners that wanted to be here, but they could not be here. I'm not sure if they emailed the city and the zoning board about their grievances. And then all the people on Prescott Street are going to be affected by these, this extra traffic. Okay. That's one of my grievances with this. The ingress and the egress, the extra trash truck, heavy equipment, heavy truck, heavy equipment coming. That's another truck. That's not going to be a city truck. That's going to be a separate one if they have a dumpster. Extra, extra deliveries, snow removal, a very small piece of property to put 10 units on. I know the neighborhood. I did a lot of research on it. It has a very very nice history dating back to the 30s, 40s when it was a Mercury dealership. The Novos owned it. It's, for us, it just doesn't work. And I do believe it will lower our property values. I do believe when, you, when you're looking for a single family house, you don't want to get a single family house in a neighborhood that has a 10 unit tenement right across the street from your house. That's the way we look at it. Anyone else like to speak? I will. I'm Janelle Marquez. Val Marquez. Janelle. Janelle. Yeah. M-A-R-Q-U-E-Z. And I'm at 2 Thomas Street. So I'm the first little house across from where they're proposing. Um, I agree with what my neighbors have all said. And I just want to add, when they were doing their presentation, they mentioned for Section 28-7-8A that there's no traffic, so there's no safety issue with going down and using that hammerhead. There's, like Mark said, so many people are walking, kids are out riding their scooters. I mean, it's, it's a safety hazard for all of us that use the street and are used to having a quiet dead end street. And that is why we bought our house, because of the quietness, the dead end street, you know, having kids. So I just wanted to state that I disagree with them saying there is no traffic, there's no safety issue with using that section. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ma'am. Yes, um, Debbie Lefebvre. F-A-V-E. -E. Okay. Um, I agree also with everyone. Um, I think that, I can't remember his name, mentioned that um, there was no addition to the house itself, but according to the blueprint, I do see <coughs> an addition to that. Um, property also I am directly across from those garages so if they build up over that I'm not going to see much of anything other than these garages and apartments now I can see things above it um, otherwise I won't when if that gets built 
also the road on Prescott Street is horrible. We've been trying to get mm -hmm. the city to redo the road. I, like I said, I've been there 42 years. Um, the road has never been done. Prescott Street, Street is the one I'm talking about. That's full of holes and every spring and fall, um, they patch it and it comes out the next season and they patch it. And this means all these additional cars going back and forth is gonna make it even worse. Um, we've asked to have it done and it has not been. Um, I don't wanna look at that across from my house every day. And I do believe that it will devalue my property. Very good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard? Any comments from code enforcement? This has been to the dev team, the development team, which is the department heads, as was mentioned. And so general services is at that meeting. So they, just to kind of let you know that the general services and engineering have both looked at this and they will look at it again when it's in front of the planning board. So, you know, will the dumpsters and some of those things will all be reviewed just so that everybody's aware. Uh, were there any other communications connected with this case? There was one um, letter that I believe was in your packet or your supplemental materials maybe last meeting and um, it's from Kelly Smith and she did emphasize that with respect to the redesign of the development she takes no position but um, she does have issues with the pavement on um, Prescott Street as was mentioned and the traffic concerns if you would like to read it all into the record you no that's not necessary it's, I think that it's was in the record good. and yep she has very serious concerns about that street. Yes. That was most of what the letter was about. Yep. Does Kelly Smith have an address? Yep. It's uh, for Thomas. Thank you. And she's not wildly impressed with how well this road's maintained. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. I think that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Lewis, would you like to offer any factual clarification in response to anything you've heard? Um, yeah, just a, I guess a couple um, things here, and I may have I may have misspoken on the the garage. Um, if you could go to the site plan view of that, mm -hmm. um, we, we're we're pulling the site we're pulling the garage back ten feet from the side property line to get it out of the side setback. I don't recall what I said on the front setback, but we are proposing right now. Uh, it's really, so the, 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 the way that garage is designed right now is the, the unit on the second floor would overhang and have a, the, the footprint is larger than the garage uh, footprint on the first floor. So we're asking for 9.6 feet, which would be the dimension from the front property line to the front face of the second floor. So that's how far the, it's encroaching. The garage is, the, is about three feet further in, so we have about 13 feet to the face of the garage. So it's going right now from seven to 13. So we're, we are pushing, pulling that garage back about six feet. Um, if I said 10 feet, I was com mixing that up with the side setback. But we are pulling it back enough so that it, there would be uh, distance there. And again, we're trying to find the sweet spot here. I think what, 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 do you, what, what Dan's trying to do is a uh, you know, reasonable use on this property. Um, I think if the, if the 10 units isn't gonna fly, uh, we're talking about nine units. So we're talking about proposed nine lot um, development here, uh, which is the allowed density, and how do we get that to work? Um, which is what he what he wants to do. We could pull that uh, front garage back further, and um, and comply with that front setback. But then we'd be close to the park, and we have to do something else with the parking in the back, um, move some spaces there. Um, we don't have 30 parking spaces. We have we do have 20 exterior parking spaces here, plus the five um, garage units, uh, which were which were counted. So those that would be that'd be 25. Um, so I think that. Like I said at the beginning, what he really wants to do right now is move forward with converting that three unit into six units, and we need the rest of these variances anyways. He'd like to fix the parking. He'd like I think to we're covering back old ground yeah. here. Um, fair enough. Prescott Street, I just wanted to say, I, and I did, I just want to um, talk about this because I didn't talk about too much about traffic, but, um, um, and, 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 I, and if, I, if I said there were multifamily units on Thomas Street, then I misspoke. There's, there's several multifamily buildings on Prescott Street. There's one duplex on Thomas Street. Um, but there are a total of 
um, on the and I'm and I'm talking about the I know the folks here from Thomas Street, but when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at you know we're at the end of a dead end, which just happens to be those two streets combined. So when we're looking at the traffic on the street, we're looking at the traffic all the way out to uh, to Ormond Street, basically. Um, there are 72 total units on those streets combined right there. 51 of those 72 are multifamily units, including the three on this property. So there is a multifamily on Thomas Street right now. Six are duplexes and 15 are single family units. If I was to do a quick or tell you the quick, you know, ITE traffic volume trip, trip generation uh, of those 72 units, it'd be 528 trips a day. That's what's existing out there. Uh, so we're talking about going from three units multifamily units to, to nine multifamily units. So we're talking about going from 72 units to 78 units on that street. So we're not talking about a significant this increase. This is units of traffic. Yeah. You, sorry, units of dwelling units. Go 72 ahead. existing dwelling units based on the tax uh, records of the oh, city. I see. Yeah. On the Prescott Thomas Street neighborhood, which I'm counting as one neighborhood, uh, the 72 existing units, if we had six more, that would be 78 units. You so eight, so you want to add seven more. Well, that's what we're saying, but I'm, I guess I'm acquiescing that, uh, okay. you know, we're allowed to have six units on there. So um, without withdrawing that variance request, um, I think that we acknowledge that maybe that is too much of an ask. But we want to move forward with the rest of it. What is, what is the right amount there, you know? So we're allowed to do nine, so let's, you know, how do we fit that on there? Um, and, uh, and do something within the confines of the, cur the current ordinance. Um, and I did want to talk a little bit about the end. Can you just scroll down a little bit on that? So we did have discussions with um, the development team a couple of times, once a couple of years ago and once this year. And we do have room. You know, what we didn't want to do was propose a new driveway entrance off of Thomas Street for those par that parking at the south because there's this opportunity to make use of the existing turnaround. Um, and we can grant an easement to the city on our property so there's more room to, to have snow storage there. And this would all be done. Uh, this, this wouldn't happen unless we had approval from the city and from general services. We think it's a better plan. Um, it would technically require us to be backing out of those parking spaces onto the street. The alternative would be to have another driveway that comes in and, and then you have another driveway on Thomas Street. We just think that's not as good of an idea. Um, it make use of this, less pavement, uh, everybody wins. So that's, that's the reason for that. If that variance was, you know, we were to sacrifice that, we just come up with some other way for the parking, but we feel like this is definitely a uh, superior plan and we would be wanting to pr pursue that with the, with the city. Um, I think that's, basically all I wanted to add. Thank you very all much. Right. Yeah, I think so. All right, thank, thank you. With <clears throat> so that, we'll declare the public testimony portion of the hearing closed. We've heard a request for uh, nine, or is it eight, uh, new apartment units to replace an existing, there are two there now? Three. Si three. Three. An existing three units. We've also heard testimony that the Appellant would like to reconfigure the site to allow the units. Part of the reconfiguration would be to improve the relationship between the existing garage and the setback from what it was before. Let's start with Ted Evans. What do you think, Mr. Evans? Um, well, I'm kind of mulling over the 10th unit and what the hardship argument would be there, and you, uh, I, I understand the neighbor's uh, sentiments, but he is allowed to have that number of units on the, on the property, not the 10th unit, the 9th unit, correct? Yes. Yeah, he's so not necessarily I, I allowed to do have, some of the other things. I do have questions about the 10th unit and the hardship aspect of it. Um, I don't think I have strong feelings about any of the other things if they're somewhat typical to this kind of development. Jim. Uh, yeah, I'm just a little confused by what they're asking. So if we don't grant the um, the tenth unit, does he still need a lot of parking variances? Yes, because of their location. Yeah. Okay. He might. Well, I don't know. I, I couldn't. Yeah, I, I didn't clean enough of from the. Do we have 18 parking spaces here? Right now. Is that what he's asking for? 18. Said there were 25 and 25 five to in include the, the five in the garage. Oh, include the five. I don't. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think he needs a very. He he's not asking for fewer than the required. 
It's not the number of parking spaces. That N no, that's not where my thinking was running at the time. Uh, but, but we'll come back to that when it's my turn to chat. Any other comments? Uh, I reserve the right to come back after I listen to it. And you have that right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Laura? I hear and appreciate the concerns of the abutters. But as Ted pointed out, nine units are permitted on this property. So I, I, I can't grant the variance for the 10th unit if for no other reason than because you admitted there's no hardship. So as far as I'm concerned, that one's off the table. But nine units is permitted. And given the dimensions of the lot, variances have to be granted from the buffer because otherwise nothing can be built on the property. Um, there are already parking spaces and the garage in the front setback. They already back into the road. The separation between the structures and the parking doesn't bother me, um, particularly given the size of the lot. Um, you know, we're not looking at whether nine units would change the neighborhood. We have to look at the variants that are requested and their impact. And I don't think those would alter the essential character of the neighborhood because of what they are. They are, you know, for the location of the parking, for backing into the road, and for smaller areas on the site. I don't think that is going to decrease surrounding property values. Um, and I think sub just substantial justice would be done. Again, given the size and the configuration of the lot, there's really no benefit to the city from enforcing the various zoning um, provisions that they're asking for relief from. So I would be inclined to grant all but the density variance. And then the parking issues, the dumpster issues, all of that is going to get fleshed out at the planning board, um, and they will address those issues. So that's my take. Thank you. Was that slow enough? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree, I think, what the others have said. Um, it, it's, I, I certainly understand the neighbor's concern. I mean, I, I would likely feel the same way if I was the neighbor, but it's a, it's a high density zone. And so anyone, anyone in that, I mean, it, it, it so happens this is a tucked back neighborhood that has a somewhat single family feel in proximity to a lot of commercial and, and multi-unit buildings, but um, it's anyone anyone looking at purchasing there would, is on notice that this is a you know this is allowed there. Um, as as far as the variance is, the the one I'm if they didn't add that that addition on the side, I don't know if they would need the buffer to the part the the seven feet to the 15. Um, I don't know. But it, none, none of the neighbor's concerns really go to, to any of the variances, except for the dead end hammerhead, which, you know, I, I am convinced because it's on, the, it's on the dead end there, it doesn't make a ton of sense for them to build a whole new driveway. So I, I tend to agree. Um, the, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said about this. Certainly the nine units can't happen unless some forgiveness is granted here, and that's why there are variances, and the configuration of the lot creates that. One question that does come up in my mind, however, is if we go to nine units and we go to the amount of parking required by the ordinance, the parking lot could be smaller. Uh, to the tune of, uh, they've got 25 parking spaces, they'd need 18 um, yeah. under the ordinance. My arithmetic says they've got seven extra spaces. Mm -hmm. If they were to eliminate even one, two, three, four, five of those spaces, they could probably, or six, they could probably reconfigure the parking lot so that it's not in the setbacks anymore. Let's see, are, are we five feet everywhere? I guess we're five feet anyway. Yeah. So the that issue. really doesn't matter, does it? No, the issue is the garage spaces in the front setback. Yeah. And the, the driveway itself, the separation between the driveway and the buildings. Yeah. 
Okay, so eliminating parking spaces doesn't actually improve things any, considering that five of them are in that other building. I mean, it does strike me as that it, if you, they eliminate those parking spots, they could have a greater separation between the structure and the parking lot, but I'm not, that variance is probably the most minimal of their requests. It's also not up to us to redesign the parking lot. We either say yes or no. I couldn't resist, <laughs> but I'm going to resist. Um, I, I, I agree with my colleagues. I think um, that uh, I would support a motion to grant all the variances except for the additional unit. We haven't heard any testimony that suggests that there's a hardship that requires the tenth unit. Would anyone care to make a motion? I will make a motion. Let's start with the denial. <laughs> I move that we deny the request to allow ten units rather than nine because there has been no evidence of unnecessary hardship that would justify that variance request. That was item two. That was item two. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The vote is unanimous, I believe, uh, that that uh, variance is denied. Would anyone care to make a motion with respect to the remaining variances? I will. I move that we approve variances 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6 to allow a reduced front, front yard to allow reduced separation between parking and primary structures, to allow a reduced perimeter buffer, to allow far five parking spaces in the garage to be located in the front setback, and to allow 12 of the required spaces to back out onto the dead end street. Based on the facts I articulated earlier, I believe that all five of the variance criteria are met. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The vote is unanimous. The variances are granted. That brings us to the next case on our agenda this evening, which is case 5722, 138 Hall Street, IN and RO Industrial and Open Space Residential Districts, Amoskeg Realty LLC and Amoskeg Beverages LLC are the owners. They wish to expand an existing industrial use in the RO district and cover 45.7% of the lot area where the RO district and uh, with, with the RO district, I mean within the RO district. Is that, is that a typo? Sorry, I was looking at the plans. Uh, Let me look at the or agenda. am I just misreading this? It says, Cover 45.7% of the lot with the RO district. Within, within. yeah. Within, okay. The RO district. And request variances to table of principal uses to allow use L1 manufacturing in the RO district and maximum lot coverage to allow 45.7% lot coverage in the RO district where 10% is permitted. Gentlemen, do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Please have a seat and identify yourselves for the record as you testify. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Eli Leno, L-E-I-N-O. I'm an attorney with Bernstein Schur in Manchester. I'm joined tonight by Jeffrey Merritt, the project engineer from Granite Engineering, as well as Zach Daniel, who is the operations manager at Amoskeg Beverages. Um, we are, as Mr. Chairman noted, asking for a variance for use and lot coverage in a portion of our lot that is in the RO zone. But first, I think it's beneficial for the board if Jeff describes the proposed uh, reconfiguration of the lot and just generally the area before I get into the five criteria. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, good evening. Just for the record, Jeff Merritt, I'm an engineer with Granite Engineering. We're the civil site engineers for the project. Try to be brief here. Um, we have two variances. Um, these are both associated with Amoskeg Beverages. Um, it's a beverage distribution facility that's located actually in Bow um, at 510 Hall Street. We have a pretty unique property. Um, the municipal boundary line actually splits this facility. Um, so on the Bow side is the building, 
And then on the Concord side is really the, the distribution side of the business. So the truck circulation, the fleet storage, um, some employee parking. So the distribution side comes off of Concord and then on the bow side is, is the existing uh, warehouse building. So on the bow side, we got a 218,000 square foot building there. Uh, Concord side is predominantly truck parking, tractor trailer parking, employee parking. There's a handful of small outbuildings there as well. Um, the other lot in Concord, which is the northern lot, is an undeveloped lot. If you've been out there and, and driven down Hall Street, it looks like a, a big lawn or a field. Uh, there were some soccer um, uh, goals on it uh, in the past, um, so it's been used for soccer historically. On the bow side, all the properties are located within the industrial district. On the Concord side, the two properties that we have um, are primarily located within the industrial district. However, there's a band of the property which is actually located within the RO district, and that's why we're here tonight. If you look on the, the map that's up there, uh, Eli can point it out, there's a, there's a swath of green land. This isn't the site industrial here, and this is the continuation of the RO zone, which is open space residential, which includes 93, and the railroad tracks and then a portion of these industrial uses. So it's pretty unique. You know, we have a, a split property in terms of municipal boundary and then we got a split property the other way in terms of um, district boundary. So the project that we're working on uh, involves both Concord and Bow. We have to go through um, Bow for site plan approval as well as the city of Concord. Um, it's a project which is less about an expansion of EM Skeg Beverages and more about um, reworking the site in the, in the building for efficiency reasons. Uh, right now what's going on and what has been going on for a long period of time is all of the inbound um, uh, shipments, so all the millions of cases that they receive a year and then distribute throughout the state comes through one single overhead door. Um, typically at a, a shipping and receiving facility like this, you would have a series of inbound doors so that um, you don't have a lineup of trucks waiting to offload. It's not a very efficient way to operate. It's been running like that for a long time and we've been working on a plan with Amiskeg to fix that. And that's what this does. So on the bow side, uh, to rectify that, since the building is in bow, there's gonna be a building addition there. Um, and we're cutting in a series of new overhead doors there to get rid of that single overhead door for the inbound receiving. So we'll have a, a dozen or so doors on the, new, on the new addition, which will fix that. On the Concord side, um, we're, gonna, we're proposing to rework that entire um, distribution side of the business and, and the fleet storage, the tractor trailer storage, the tractor trailer circulation, and the employee parking that's out there today. So all those uses exist out there today in some shape or form but our project proposes to reconfigure them in a more efficient and, and better manner. Better manner. Um, You'd be building new building and paving? New paving, exactly. In the RO district, what's gonna happen is th those uses that are already there today, the truck circulation, parking, et cetera, those accessory uh, industrial uses, um, get further extended north into the RO district, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, in the industrial district, so those portions of the project that are gonna be located in the Concord's industrial district, those are allowed by right. It's just the band of the RO district that kind of frustrates the project. And so the, the two variances we're seeking is, is first one for the use um, to allow these accessory industrial uses that again are already there today but to be reconfigured and further expanded to allow that to happen in the RO district. And then secondly is for lot coverage. So in the RO district, since that's a residential district, uh, the lot coverage, which would typically be um, necessary or, or, or practical for development in that district is only 10%. And that lines up with a house and a driveway and, and, and a, you know, a shed, that kind of thing. Um, on the flip side, the industrial district, uh, the lot coverage is 80%. So as we expand our industrial um, development into the RO district, um, our lot coverage is at about 45.7%. So we're seeking our second variance involves a lot coverage variance to go from 10% to 45%. But again, we're right adjacent to the industrial district, which um, has the 80% um, coverage requirement. And Could I'll you point out on the map, I may not, it may be right here, but I'm not seeing it. 
what is the what is the part that you're building in the RO district yeah. that's not there now? So I'm going to point on this, and then we'll look at the site plan. So and what is the red area? Is that not your property at all? No, this that's just a zoning overlay. That's a different zoning okay. district. <laughs> so follow me here. This gray area, that's the existing building. Yeah. This line right here, see that? That's the town line. That's the town line. This wedge-shaped lot is lot three. That's where the distribution is. See that? See the road coming in. Fleet storage, truck circulation. And that's all there now. That's all there today. Okay. Yeah. Yep. This is the soccer field or lawn, whatever you want to call it here. So what we're proposing to do in this green band is this line of edge of pavement here gets shifted north. So we we further move this direction. So in this green area right here, we're doing the same shift north, if you will, with the site in this area over here, but that's all permitted by right. It's just this fringe area right here that frustrates it. And again, like I said before, this type of use exists there today. This isn't a use which is new or, or foreign to the area. This exists there today. Similar over here, you know, industrial district here, you even got some industrial use here. So it, it's very, it's quite trivial in, in, in some respects. There's no, even though it's residential open, there's no residential no. houses anywhere near there, right? No, I don't know why it's residential. Um, when you look at it on the map, you know, this is what, Grapponi, I think this is, yeah, so this is Grapponi down, yeah. let me get my bearings here. No, this is the gas station. So these are gas stations here, right? This is Grapponi. Um, this is uh, part of the gas station as well with the, the truck storage out back there. This is all commercial here. And then there's the interchange, the highway, that is in the RO district. And then this is the industrial. So we've got industrial, residential, commercial. There's this, I, think I don't know. It, we, we talked about the zoning change for the other application. It seems like this would be a spot where if any of you were in between Hall Street and the railroad tracks, you would think you were in the industrial zone. The railroad tracks would certainly have been a reasonable spot to separate those zones, not to mention that obviously the car dealership, et cetera, and the highway. I guess need to be zoned something, but I don't think it's a residential open space. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's just kind of illogical, at least the residential district on our property, to ever put residential there. You'd have to cross through the industrial zone to get there. So it, you know, it, it didn't make sense. So anyways, that's the project. Um, Eli, is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, again, I realized that the board has a full agenda. I did want to go briefly through the five criteria here. Um, the variance will not be contrary to the public interest, a standard which it would need to change the essential character of the locality, threaten the public health, safety, or welfare, or unduly conflict with the ordinance. Again, this is a zone that clearly should be fully industrial. It's all industrial uses between the railroad and Hall Street, and we just want to continue the use that is already there not frustrating the purposes of this ordinance or changing anything to the detriment of the neighbors. Um, again, observing the spirit of the ordinance, as noted, we've asked for variance from this RO 10% piece, but we are well on the entire lot in conformance with the industrial lot coverage of 85%, I believe. Uh, again, throughout the whole property, our lot coverage is plus or minus 50% in bow and in the conquered pieces of this. So again, well within the spirit of the ordinance. Um, the substantial justice balancing test here, the proposal is consistent with the property's current use. And if we're not granted these variants, it frustrates the expansion of this, which again, is not on the side closer to any of the few residential homes in the area along the bank of the river. This is really as remote on the property as it can be from any abutter especially any non-industrial abutter um, to the north. So uh, the balancing test certainly indicates that the private rights here of the applicant, I think, can be, um, the, the relief can be granted without negatively harming anyone. Um, uh, property values, again, the railroad right of way, the industrial uses to the north and the south, and then this being as far removed from any of the residential lots uh, uh, closer to the river. I think that this is as minimal as one could expect while improving uh, the value of this property and the use of this industrial zone. And uh, the literal enforcement would result in the unnecessary hardship. 
one of the criteria to consider is the uniqueness of this lot with respect to the substantial relationship with the public purpose of the ordinance. This law, as Jeff has said, bisected twice, both by the town line and this illogical law, or illogical zoning line is certainly a one of one in this area of town. No one else is uh, uh, fronted with those two issues and um, proposed use being reasonable is it's existing, it's of right in the industrial zone and Interestingly, if this whole area were zoned industrial, the, we'd only need one variance because the accessory parking use would be allowed if the underlying use were allowed. But because it's in that residential zone for reasons, it requires this variance here. So there's a substantial hardship if that's not granted without a benefit to the public purpose. So that's for the use variance. I think the criteria the similar factors, of course, for the lot remains unique, the public purpose remains the same, but of course, um, it's asking for the area, asking to be 45% coverage in that RO zone. As Jeff said, a house with a garage and maybe a shed comes in around 10% of lot coverage, so that's understandable in a zone that requires two acre lots, not for industrial uses. That wasn't what was considered in this parcel, so. Um, it's the, the zoning line there is basically inconsistent with the ordinance, whereas what we've proposed would be consistent with the use as an industrial lot that's been successful over the years, provides an opportunity for Amoskeg to improve the efficiency of their building without being forced to look for a new bigger location somewhere else, really has the efficiency of allowing them to continue here and put uh, the new engineering plan into play. Um, Again, substantial justice and detriment to the neighbors, et cetera. I do not see one at this remote piece of the lot. Of course, the whole area is industrial and I don't know how harmonious that is with the riverfront houses, but this is as far removed on this lot as it can be from any of the other uses that wouldn't really comport with it. Um, and again, the lot is unique and the use I think we've shown over the years is reasonable and works well in this industrial zone. So I don't think I need to belabor the point, but we'd all be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Questions from the board? Andrew, any questions? No. Jim? No. Ted? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone here who'd like to be heard in opposition to it? Uh, code enforcement, any comments? Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, is a beer distributorship or, or a, a, a beverage of some sort distributorship industrial, not warehouse? It's actually, it's a, it's a separate use on the table of uses and it's allowed in the industrial district. I see. So it is a specific use, a it is. distribution facility. It's a beverage use, literally. My, aren't we precise? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do you have any idea why the zoning ordinance, the zoning's drawn that way? I'm too new to know okay. all of the. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm not new and I don't know. <laughs> Very good. I, with that, we'll uh, close the public testimony portion of the hearing, and I'll invite discussion. Let's start down at Andrew's end of the table. How do you see this, Mr. Winters? Uh, well, I mean, it it's, seems like a no-brainer to me. I mean, it's, it's obviously kind of surprising. I never thought about what a highway is zoned at because it, it never comes up, but I guess there's no highway zone, so it's good. <laughs> um, so I, it, you know, there's obviously no other, no, 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 no residential use or po possible use anywhere near there. So it, you know, would defeat the purpose to, you know, enforce this strictly. Oh. I agree. Neither uh, variance is going to alter the essential character of that industrial neighborhood. Um, neither variance is going to diminish surrounding property values. Enforcing the zoning ordinance strictly is not going to result in substantial justice. And if there's ever been a unique lot, this is one of them. Very good. Jim? Yeah, I have nothing to add to. I agree. I do too. I think you could have argued this as a governor's island situation where you can't use it. 
Mm, you could have, yeah. yeah. I mean, they don't call it that anymore, but that's, boy, am I dating myself. Okay. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that right there. Very good. Uh, would anyone care to make a motion? I move that we approve both of the requested variances. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The vote is unanimous. The variances, and there were two, I believe, are granted. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. You're welcome. Night. That brings us to case 0003, 2022, 0 Elm Street, Pennecook, RN Neighborhood Residential District, Kathleen A. and Scott W. Preve, trustees. The owner wishes to reverse the zoning administrator's decision and that the city recognize the grandfathered status of lot eight as a separate lot of record. We better turn the lights on for you. You're going to be old school in the dark over there. Can we turn those lights on? How do we do that? I'm sure I can. Um, I think that slide dimmer back there does it. No, nope, that's good. Oh. Okay. <coughs> now you done it. Uh oh. That oh, wasn't it. Don't do that. We gotta do better than that. What about what's this? Should we try this one? Oh, I just gotta be more patient. It takes an architect to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say a room full of engineers. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mention an English major. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Bernier, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but? I do. And you as well, ma'am. I do. Would you please identify yourselves for the record as you testify? Certainly. Uh, good evening. Um, here tonight, uh, with the, something that I've been dealing with for 27 years and I thought was over, but uh, came soaring back a couple of months ago. Um, Kathleen Preview uh, owns a piece of property <laughs> on Elm Street in. Um, in Pentecook, and uh, the family's owned the property since 1946. Um, they bought the second lot in 1946, the first lot in 1943. Um, they bought the second lot uh, um, to operate a business um, and did so until the mid 1990s. Um, they've, they've owned the property um, as separate, two separate lots, always paid taxes on it. Uh, it's always been taxed as a separate building lot. Um, they paid full taxes on it. Uh, the current assessment is $119,900. Um, they've been paying taxes on the property as, a, as an existing lot for decades as a, as a building lot, clearly. $119,900 as a building lot. Um, they, uh, uh, Kathleen um, decided that it was time to, to move on and, and sell the properties. Um, this, this piece she hung on to uh, after her husband passed um, his investment property to, in hopes that it would uh, return some, some money for retirement. Um, the uh, a prospective buyer uh, went to seek a building permit and was told that the lot had been um, stripped of its grandfathered status and wasn't eligible for a building permit. Um, the statute currently um, defines this as an involuntary merger. It's not really a great description of, of what took place, but um, it, the statute has a definition. I'll, I'll read it. It says an involuntary merger and involuntary merged means lots merged by municipal action for zoning, comma, assessing or taxation purposes without the consent of the owner. Um, that's the statutory definition of, of an involuntary merger. Uh, the statute 674.39 goes on to say that no city, town, county, or village district may merge pre-existing subdivided lots or parcels except upon the consent of the owner. Um, there are many different avenues of, or mechanisms for merger. Um, one of them is, is what has been occurring since probably 1995 is when I first started to get phone calls in my office. I'm a land use consultant, um, work with zoning and, and 
subdivision regulations extensively. Former planning board member, planning board chairman. Um, I worked on the 2004 zoning ordinance with the chair um, back in the day. And um, very familiar with, with it. Um, and in my office, we would get calls prior, prior to 2004, we'd get calls, I think, you know, you know, five or six times. I got calls from people who went to get a building permit on a lot that they'd owned for years and were told that oh, because you own the lot next door, um, it's no longer grandfathered and you can't build on it. Um, this, was, this was very difficult for a lot of people because they were paying full taxes on it. So it was only merged for zoning purposes. That's, a, that's important because some municipalities would, would merge lots um, by erasing lines on tax maps. So one day you have two lots on the tax map and the next day the line's gone and now there's just one there. Um, that, was, that was a form of merger that some municipalities were doing prior to 1995. Um, and, but this, this one is specific to zoning. This was kind of unique. And it was very difficult for a lot of people um, to deal with. It didn't merge the lots. The, the biggest problem with it is, is the municipalities never had the authority to, to actually merge the lots. You have a, a piece of land that has a title at the Registry of Deeds in the county government, and, and that title is there. And municipalities never had the authority to reach into the county government's Registry of Deeds and alter the title of the property. What they could do is they could erase it off the tax map um, and, and, and remove any grandfathered status that it had by zoning. So they're essentially merging it by, by zoning. Um, the problem with that is that they would continue to get taxed as, th th there's two major problems with that. First, they'd get, continue to get taxed as a building lot even though it could not be built on, which could be quite painful if that went on for decades, which it did in this case. Um, the other problem uh, with it is that the owners were never notified. There was absolutely no notice when zoning uh, eliminated uh, the property. So they would continue to pay taxes thinking it was a building lot, thinking it was part of their retirement uh, investment portfolio and that everything was good. And then when they went to sell it, um, they would get denied, a, the, the prospective buyers would get denied a building permit and then would tell the, the landowners that the property is essentially worthless. Um, in, in 2004, the city of Concord adopted a, a new zoning ordinance. And within that ordinance, uh, they codified this act. Uh, 28.8.3 essentially um, says that if you own two contiguous parcels and one of them is um, non-conforming to the current zoning statute um, and it can be made conforming somehow, it doesn't really clarify, um, the lots are not, cons the lot is no longer considered non-conforming. So it loses its grandfathered status as a separate lot essentially. So 2883 effectively consolidates non-conforming lots of record even when they are separate tracts of land in the, in the county registry of deeds. And even when they're being taxed as separate lots of land, which is very, very difficult. After 2004, this became the, the process that the city of Concord and the code office worked under. And during those years, um, I got uh, about two calls a year from people who were, had their property merged in this manner. Some of them uh, did come and get, try to get variances. Uh, some of those variances were granted, some of them were denied, um, and, and some of them just couldn't afford to go that process. So they had their properties merged, and even though they'd been paying taxes on their separate lots for years. Um, the wheels of justice move slow, <laughs> but they do move. And in 2010, um, the legislature passed a law that said, as I read, that no city, town, county, or village district may merge pre-existing subdivided lots or parcels except upon the consent of the owner. And they passed it, uh, they made that the law. Um, that went into effect in 2010. Um, from 2010 till 2022, I received no phone calls in my office from people who had their property merged. So I had assumed that this was a, a done issue. Um, uh, however, the 288, three is still in your zoning ordinance. It's still there and it still says the same thing. It still says that two lots that are owned by the same person that, are, that have any non-conformity will be merged if the conformity goes away if they're merged. So that, lot, that, that ordinance is still in the books but the, the code department was not enforcing it for 
um, 10 years. And, and then um, in August of this year, I got a phone call from a builder who said, gee, I, I went to get a building permit on this lot. And they're saying it's not a lot of record, even though it's shown in the tax map. We have a survey of it. Um, and, and so I, I looked at it. I did some research. It's clearly a separate lot of record. There is some caveats in case law about um, voluntary merger where a landowner does something that merges the two lots, like if you were to build a house across the lot line. Um, and there's really good case law since 2010 that really helps people like me when people come into my office to understand when a lot is merged and when it's not. There was nothing in the history of this lot that would suggest that the lot was, was merged by um, a physical act of, of merging the lot. Um, they, the, the second lot was a business, like I said, so there was a residence on one lot. They operated a business on the other lot um, from the late 1940s till mid-1990s. Um, the only structure uh, currently on the lot, there was a, there was a um, Quonset Hut garage for a while, which is now gone, but the, the, the only garage that's on the lot was the business and housed the business. What type of business was that? Uh, they recycled cardboard. They had a, a baler inside a building in there. Um, and um, so the, the lot was, was separate. It never, there was no physical merger of the two lots uh, at any time. The, um, so I was like, oh, the, the um, code's just confused. And I says, let me just, you know, I'll just go down and talk to code and we'll get this straightened out. And, and I did, and I met with, with code. Um, and and uh, the meeting went, went sort of well, but I didn't really get the sense that um, they understood the issue uh, in the history of, of this involuntary merger statute and, and the history of it. So um, shortly thereafter, on September 27th, we got a um, decision. So, so Code said, we'll, we'll make a decision and we'll, we'll let you know. So on the 27th, we received um, a decision. And that, that decision, Um, that decision uh, was st stated that 2883A3, which is the 2883 um, statute, of the City of Concord Zoning Ordinance excludes land from nonconforming lot status. So that doesn't have its grandfathered status. If they do not conform with current dimensional requirements and adjoining another lot with the same owner, contiguous ownership issue, that could make the lots conforming. Code went on to defend 2883 by stating that they were uh, unaware of any case law or statute that would prohibit application of this ordinance. Um, so I went back to code and, and provided um, some documentation on the new statute. So in 2004, we had a code that was written that said that lots in common ownership could get merged by the by the uh, code office. In 2010, the state legislature said, no, you can't do that. Um, and, and some municipalities tried to keep doing it and they actually amended it a couple times to make it even clearer that no, you really can't do that. Um, the Municipal Association, which is a, an association for municipalities and they have attorneys there. Um, and in 2000, I think it was 2013, they put this question and answer um, format together an attorney for the, for the Municipal Association did that. And the question was, what is the law now? And uh, the answer from the Municipal Attorney was, um, in short, involuntary mergers are no longer legally enforceable and, the, and owners whose lots have been involuntarily merged have an opportunity to restore the former law lines. She goes on to say, this change occurred in 2010 when RSA 674-39A was amended to add the following sentence, which is the one I read, no city, town, county, or village district may merge pre-existing subdivided lots or parcels except upon the consent of the owner was added to the statute. It became an effect on September 18th, 2010. In other words, no involuntary merger provision may be legally added to a zoning ordinance now and those in existence were no longer are were no longer enforceable after the effective date of the law. So essentially, what the Municipal Association is saying is that you can't do what, what 2883 says you can do anymore. So in 2004, you could. In 2010, you couldn't. 
so and I think that's why I stopped getting phone calls because it stopped <laughs> happening so we fast forward um, I provided this information I kept going back and forth I begged um, coach not to do this because it's it's really cruel um, uh, to, to somebody if you could imagine you have this investment um, you know some people do invest in real estate as as an investment for their retirement and other things you it's assessed at one hundred nineteen thousand nine hundred dollars um, you're planning on that and then all of a sudden totally unknown to you it's not worth nothing you've been paying taxes on it all along and all of the value of their property is just gone and you're so it, it's very very hard and, and I and I, it's been very hard to deal with for us in the office when people come in and we have to deal with it so I I really tried to do the best I could but I never I never could could get a sense from code that they really understood the issue um, and and I, code um, looked to, to other people and I encouraged that um, to the, the city's attorney and others but I I don't think that they ever when I got the response back from, from the people that they interacted with in the city, the, the answers seemed to me as though the right question didn't get asked. You know, so it, and, and I really, the last thing I want to do is be here tonight because it, it costs money to have me here and, and we're just continuing to, to wind this down. Um, but unfortunately, the 30-day clock, um, we have to file an appeal within 30 days or we lose the ability to do that. Um, so we had to file an appeal an administrative decision and that's that's why we're here tonight i continued to work with with code and hope that that they would come to a resolution and i i really i i, I kind of get their perspective i mean you know the, the brand new the, both uh, dave and, and tracy are brand new to the city i get that they wrote a decision and now we're at we were asking them to say oh well, yeah we got it wrong and and uh, they just were you know being brand new I wouldn't want to do it either. I wouldn't want to say I got it wrong after I wrote it down. So, um, you know, it, it got, we're here because of that. And it, it's tough, I get it, but, um, you know, this, uh, Kathleen's been a resident her whole life of the city of Concord, um, raised kids here, um, paid an enormous amount of taxes on this property that's now worthless. And, and we really would appreciate the board if they would reinstate it as, as a lot of record. Um, code had put together a mem memorandum of, of uh, for tonight's meeting for you guys to review. Um, it, it starts out with facts. Um, the first bullet point is that the city has not involuntarily merged the two lots. Um, the city has always treated the parcels as two separate lots for the purposes of the zoning map and tax collection. Which is absolutely true. Tax them. Jesus out of it. The, the two lots have separate tax identification numbers and shown in the tax maps as separate lots and receive separate tax bills. That is also true. The first statement is not true. Um, the statute is very clear about the definition of an involuntary merger. Um, you don't have to merge, you don't have to erase the tax map line. It's not an inclusive requirement. Um, it lists each one of the items separately in the statute. You can merge the lots by zoning, which is what they what code did is they said, okay, we didn't we didn't merge the lots by tax reasons, but we merged them for zoning purposes. Um, so it, the, the first statement is incorrect that they that they were not involuntarily merged. They most by the statutory definition, they most definitely were involuntarily merged for zoning purposes. Um, it, it, several other bullet points um, about the history of the lot. There's some inconsistencies in, the, in what took place, but none of these are really relevant to the, uh, to our case. Um, so that she owns, uh, that Kathleen owned two lots. She has sold one of them. Um, the lot that lost its grandfather status, she couldn't sell because it's not worth anything, um, but she couldn't sell it for nothing either. She couldn't give it away. She can't do anything with it right now. Um, but she no longer lived in the house. Um, and needed to sell it because she couldn't support it over the winter. So uh, her residence was sold, so now she just owns lot eight. Um, and this is the lot that we're, we're here tonight about. Uh, really is irrelevant to the case. I mean, the, this lot is either a lot of record or it's not. Um, so, uh, you know, what's taken place in the last 
three weeks or a month and a half or two months is kind of relative to the bigger picture of, you know, is this a lot of record or not? These, this is a copy of the subdivision plan um, that created this lot. This, this was redrafted because the original is not in the best of condition. Uh, the lots were, were created in 1906. Um, they were sold off. Lot 8 is shown as lot 6 on this map. Um, the, the previous re residence was on lot 7 um, uh, that's shown on this map. The, uh, all of the lots have 75 feet of frontage. These lots were all sold to different owners. Um, so from 1906, uh, lots 6 and 7 were, sh were sold to different owners. Um, the previous uh, um, Kathleen's in-laws uh, purchased <laughs> lot the first lot in 1943 and the second lot in 1946 from different owners. Um, operated a business on one, lived on the other, <coughs> never merged the lots as a single lot of record other than they owned them in the same name. Which is really, it's a really minor thing. If, if, if Kathleen and her husband owned one of the lots and Kathleen owned the other, it wouldn't be common ownership. The fact that they put it in the same name, which is so arbitrary, it's, it, that's what makes this, this application law so cruel is it's so arbitrary. If you just do one little thing, you're, out, you're safe. This lot, if, the, if this lot had never been brought into common ownership with the exact same name, it would be a lot of record and it would have its grandfather's status. So it, it's just a really subtle, subtle thing. Um, uh, so it goes on, some, some other bullet points under the appeal. Um, I guess these are arguments um, to, to, uh, for the board to agree with code. Um, the first bullet point is that uh, because the lots were never involuntary or administratively merged, which again is incorrect, clearly by st the statutory definition of vol involuntary merge, they've been merged for zoning purposes. But you're not here under the statute. If you were here under the statute, you'd be in front of the city council. No, no, this is where we appeal a code of administrative decision. Under the statute, if you want to have involuntarily merged lots unmerged, you go to the city council. We're not. This law was never merged. Exactly. It was merged. We're asking you to, re it was merged on September 27th by code, and we're asking you to reverse that decision. That's an appeal of an administrative decision. But she's not saying it was merged. She's saying that under the zoning ordinance, it came into common ownership, and therefore it no longer has the protection of a non conforming lot. Not that it's no longer a lot of record. It can still be developed, it just needs variances. That's not what the statute says. The statute says you can't why do that. Why don't you finish up, and, and we'll discuss it among ourselves. So, um, so in the first uh, bullet point argument against um, that they weren't administratively merged, which they were, uh, there's no basis for the appeal. Um, as the city has involuntarily merged lots while under common ownership, uh, the lots are deemed to be s separate lots and have not been merged. Um, very difficult to follow as demonstrated by the fact that lot nine was recently sold. Yes, where our argument is that they're separate lots of record and that they're have grandfathered statted as separate lots of record. Um, the second, the RSA 674-39A only prohibits the municipality from merging pre-existing subdivided lots without the consent of the owner. I would agree with that. Um, even if the lots had been involuntarily merged, which they were, she says they were not, um, RSA 674-39AA provides that the restoration of lots to their pre-merger status shall not be deemed to cure any non-conformity with the existing local land use ordinance. Um, under the statute, the lots were never merged, therefore they are, we're not asking for them to be restored. The, the restoration section of the statute deals with lots that were merged years ago. Lot lines were erased off the tax map and, and the lots were gone. This was never the case in the situation. Um, these lots were always separate lots of record until September 27th when it was denied a building permit. So, and, and, and this decision was, was written. Um, so we're not asking you to restore the lots. We're asking you to, to vacate the decision that they're not lots of record and that they are grandfathered like any other lot of record uh, in, the, in the city. Um, the New Hampshire statutes uh, do not, the third bullet point, the New Hampshire statutes do not invalidate ordinances prevented, uh, preventing the development of contiguous lots that were once on a common. The, the city is allowed to apply uh, its definition conditions and, and, and because a lot does not meet the requirements of the development of a one family detached dwelling unit, it must obtain a variance. Um, 
The New Hampshire statute absolutely does. The Municipal Association has said that the, the, the ordinance that consolidated these lots is invalid. It, and we provided that information as a legal opinion from a municipal attorney that works for municipalities. Um, so it, the statute most definitely does say that you can't have a zoning ordinance that does this. It's illegal. Um, and then the, the fourth and final bullet point is the applicant relies on the article written by the New Hampshire Municipal Association, but this article does not address the applicant's arguments. The New Hampshire Practice Series recognizes the restoration of lots to their pre-merger status does not cure any non-conformity. Again, we're talking about restoring. We don't want the lot restored. This was a lot of record that, was, that had grandfathered status and could be built on. The, it is short. Uh, it is a 75 feet of frontage. I believe it's 80 feet is required. Um, and it's short, so it's two nonconformities that, that we need reinstated are frontage and lot size. Um, it, it can be built on and meet all the other zoning requirements in that district, um, but has a lot of record. Created in 1906, it was a valid lot of record. It, it was a valid lot of record up until September 27th, 2022, um, when this decision was made. So. Um, you know, we're just asking you to, to, to reinstate, reinstate it as a lot with its grandfathered status so that it can be sold um, and built on and re restore its value um, because essentially the value of the property has been, has been stolen from it despite the fact that it's assessed at $119,900 and, and the previous have been paying that amount of money in taxes for, for decades. Um, so that... That's pretty much it. I hope I was brief enough and quickly enough. There's a lot of information. It's a very complex issue, um, a lot of history. Um, uh, Questions from the board? Before we get into that, just procedurally, I just want to get a better understanding about um, this. It's a dense set of facts. There's probably opinions on either side. It's, we, we seem to be asking to, be in, to interpret something that just seems out of the norm that it would be before the zoning board. I'm not yeah. unsympathetic. I certainly get it. I'm just saying we're getting presented a, a, a pretty pretty dense set of issues before us tonight. So. And we, we could. It, it is within our purview to overturn or not overturn. Or continue portion. and ask Jim Kennedy. Or, right. So we, we could ask for help, which is what, is that what you're suggesting we yes. want to do? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? I didn't do anything, just I don't, don't want to do, I think you've preserved your, by being here, you probably preserved the 30-day clock. I don't want to do anything to interfere with that. I didn't even know if that's the case, but. <laughs> right. Go, 30 days went fast. Yep. I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. Uh, according to your position, and I, I, are you saying that the involuntary merger occurred in September of this year with this decision? There was no notice to the all landowners prior to that. Um, they had no reason to believe the lots were merged for zoning purposes. So, but so because you're saying there was an involuntary merger, you're saying it, it just occurred based on this decision. That's the first anybody that is associated with this lot was aware that there was an issue with it not being a lot. So up until then, your position is it was never merged. There have always been separate lots. Always got separate tax bills. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in fact, in 2014, which is after the statute was, was um, done, the law was surveyed. Uh, this plan is recorded. It was surveyed as a separate lot um, of record. A copy of this plan was given to the city. This is in 2014. And uh, nobody said anything about, well, wait a minute, it's not a lot. And so, no reason to, to believe that it was not. <coughs> Other questions? Ted, any questions? Andrew, any more questions? No. Laura, would you like to ask a question? No question. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. I would ask that um, if additional testimony has been presented, if we could have an opportunity to rebut it. Appreciate that. Yeah, if you keep it very brief. <laughs> I'll do my absolute best. Okay. Thank you. I think given the nature of this particular request, we should go right over to code enforcement and ask Ms. Hutton to uh, fill us in on anything she thinks we ought to hear. Um, yep. Um, just to clarify um, my background, I've been in municipal planning for over 20 years. 
it's actually Dr. Hutton, and I have a degree in law and policy. So um, as Tim stated, he got um, his information from the New Hampshire Municipal Association, and I don't argue the information that he had, but it does go on to say that restoration of lots does not um, cure the nonconformity. So if they had been merged, which they have not, they could not have been sold separately, which they were. So in order to sell a lot that's been merged, you need permission from the city council, which they did not need because they were not merged. So you're saying you can sell a non conforming <coughs> lot? Absolutely. Sure. Right. Um, additionally, um, I know that um, Mr. Bernier is of the opinion that the city can't apply its definitions um, that are in the zoning ordinance to lots um, if they're grandfathered nonconforming lots of record. And that isn't entirely accurate. So the, if the city has definitions or standards for a lot, they can still apply those regardless of what other things are existing around them. So all we're saying is that yes, this is a separate lot, but yes, it needs a variance to meet the standards of the current ordinance. Because of uh, whatever that number was, 2883? Correct. Okay. Correct. Because it, that, it, that section of the ordinance is clear that it is not, it does not exist um, exempt from the ordinance, essentially, if they were held in common ownership. Cure it, so to speak, of its Correct. deficiency. Okay. Correct. Questions? So your position is not that there, there was a voluntary merger. Your position is there's never been a merger. Correct. But that it does not retain, that other lot does not retain its, quote, grandfather, grandparent rights. As Mr. Bernier is applying that term, yes. Because nonconforming lots have no inherent right under the law to be developed at all without a variance. Correct. Only when the zoning ordinance gives it permission for nonconforming lots to be developed absent meeting all of the conditions can they be developed so the city is absolutely within its power to say some non-conforming lots can be developed this way and other non-conforming lots if they are brought into common ownership cannot be and it has nothing to do with the statute and nothing to do with the merger is that your view it is but do we so but according to that code um it, it has to do with it, whether it was under common owners ownership at the effective date of this ordinance, which was 2000, this ordinance or 2004? In previous versions, this, these lots, as Mr. Bernier stated, have been in common ownership since the 40s. So because they came into common ownership, they lost their non-conforming status, but not their status as a lot of record, correct? Mm -hmm. Other questions? So if we if we upheld the um, code enforcement decision, the applicant then the property owner could come back for variance. To Correct. That? Yeah, for a specific proposal. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this subject? Mr. Bernier, is there anything else that you can add that's new? Uh, just to address the comments that were made, um, the first thing, uh, there was a, a comment that I had said that the definitions in the ordinance couldn't couldn't be utilized. That's not what I said. It's not what the municipal association said either. What the municipal association said, association said, and what I said was that if you have a zoning ordinance, it's adopted in 2004, and then the state legislature passes a law in 2010 that makes something in that ordinance uh, illegal something that a municipality can't do anymore, that section can no longer be uh, enforced in the ordinance. It makes it, I, I forget the exact words the attorney used, but it, it just, it makes it go away. You, you can't void. apply it, void. It preempts it. Would you say so, that it's a fair statement to say that you disagree with the code enforcement officer about the definition of an involuntary merger? <laughs> um, I, I don't think that, I think that I, just reading the statute has a definition. I read it. I think it's pretty clear. Um, I'm not. I don't really think that the definition that code is using. 
I don't really know. Involuntary merger can mean a lot of different things. It doesn't mean just one thing, and I think that's the problem. I think code is saying that involuntary merger means one thing and only one thing, and the statute does not require that. The statute says that it can be an involuntary merger for zoning, uh, for assessing, or, and it uses the term or, taxation. So they're, they're exclusive. You can, and, and in this particular case, the involuntary merger is strictly a <coughs> zoning. Uh, so it's your contention, and I think you did say this before, that uh, you do not need to change the lot lines for it to be merged under the, the lot. Right, You're correct. It could be just a zoning merger, which is, which is typically how the city of Concord has done this for the last uh, few years, which is, and the, the problem with doing it that way is there's absolutely no notice. When you erase it off the tax map, you used to get ta two tax bills, and then all of a sudden you get one. So you're kind of put on notice that, hey, something's changed. Um, when they do it this way and only steal the, the zoning aspect of it, your grandfather's status, then um, you get no notice at all. You have no idea that, that the value of your property is gone. It doesn't seem really what you're saying is that the, the quote, involuntary, what you say is the involuntary merger really occurred when they made the zoning ordinance in 2004 because it's the zoning ordinance that says that, that if they're under uh, common ownership, that they don't retain their grandfather right. You could you could interpret it that way. However, the, that's not how it's been implied in, in the city. The city, some lots are merged, some lots aren't. There's absolutely no reason why some are and some aren't. Um, it's always been that way. Um, but you have, you have no re no reason to know that that's not a separate lot until somebody tells you it's not a separate lot. Um, well, I so suppose you, the you zoning order itself was, gets public notice, so someone. You could interpret that way, but I would, yeah. yeah. yeah we, we did so have cases coming in uh, prior to when the 2010 law was passed where people, the city essentially said because of the way the ordinance is written, you, you effectively have one lot here, not two, even though there's a line down the middle of it, and that's, that could happen for a number of reasons. You can't treat it as two lots. You have to treat it as one lot, period. And that's what was made illegal, was mm -hmm. I as I understand it. The provisions would say something like when two non-conforming lots come into common ownership, they shall be deemed one lot and be made, and that's not what this provision So there's a little institutional knowledge for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then finally, uh, this comment about um, non-conforming lots can't be d developed. Um, a non, a grand, there's a grandfather um, provision in our state law, that if, if a lot gets created, just because you, you <laughs> just because you change the zoning ordinance, um, doesn't mean that. So if somebody, if you approved a subdivision of the planning board approved a subdivision on on Tuesday, and the zoning ordinance got changed on Wednesday, doesn't doesn't vacate all those lots. It those lots still exist and they can still be developed. They, if and if they're no longer in compliance with things like frontage and lot size doesn't mean that they can't be developed. They can still be built on as long as they meet the other criteria like the building setbacks and those kinds of things. They don't need a variance to be built on for frontage because they're a grandfathered pre-existing non-conforming lot. They existed, they were conforming at the time that they were created as, as those I don't, lots were. I don't think there's an argument about that though. Uh, yeah, it was just a statement um, that one of the board members made that, that Non-conforming lots could not be developed without a variance. No, what I said was non-conforming lots can be developed in accordance with the ordinance, and the ordinance may allow them to be developed without a variance. Right, and these could, this lot could be developed without a variance if it were still grandfathered. If it was still grandfathered, right. if the frontage and the lot size. Was I think still we're all in agreement about that. Okay. All right. <coughs> Thank you, Q. Well, that will declare the public testimony portion of the hearing closed, and I'm not going to recite a summary of it because you all heard it. I think everybody's familiar with what got said. Um, let's address a question that uh, Jim raised to begin with. And let me pull the board without necessarily saying what I think. Uh, do, do you, would you want to get further legal advice on this subject before you made a decision? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think it's uh, it's uh, three yeses and two noes, <laughs> which uh, 
Because oh. I'm, I'm I, I, I think I know how I come down on this. Okay. Uh, but out of respect for the other members who would like more information, we have it at our fingertips. We owe it to the appellant to do that if we can, and we can. Um, I believe the proper procedure then would be for us to table the case and uh, pending consultation with the city attorney and then take it off the table once we'd had a discussion with the city attorney and had the benefit of their um, their view on it. My qu question, it's been a while since we've done that, Did do we have to then allow further testimony or can we just deliberate at that point? We can deliberate. Because at this point, it doesn't seem like really the facts are in much dispute and we wouldn't be hearing any more testimony, so I don't think, do we have to have everyone come back? Uh, they, they can come back, but. I, I guess that's something to ask the attorney. In okay. other situations, the conversations we've had have been considered privileged. In other words, we're not obliged to, well, you know, you're a lawyer. Yeah. That means. Uh, I only know stuff about like T-squares and things like that. He might say in this case or she, depending on who we're talking to, um, now in this case you gotta, you gotta make public whatever I tell you. Okay. In which case that's what we'll do. Okay. Or the board might choose to do that. Yeah, yeah. So since I'm hearing a three to two majority, would somebody care to make a motion to table the case pending consultation with the city? I move that we Any? table the case pending consultation with the um, city attorney. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Uh, I vote aye too. If we're going to do it, let's do it. We're going to ask for help. Let's do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we have I didn't a take a break? Hmm? You going to take a break? Oh, no, I said aye. Yeah. Oh, you did? I did? Yeah, no, you guys want. I completely support that. We certainly can. It looks like we are, <laughs> because the room is clearing out. <laughs> I'm all by myself up here. Five minute break, ladies and gentlemen.
Yeah. All right. Next case is we're going to. There are two cases here that are closely related. In fact, they are next door to each other and involve the same question. So I'm going to ask the appellants for both cases to come up at once. This will be case 007 2022 and 008 2022. 11 Perkins Street, RN Neighborhood Residential District, Nancy E. Mellet or Millet, owner, uh, wishes to execute a lot line adjustment with 1315 Perkins Street and request variances to Article 2841B minimum lot size to allow a resulting lot of 5,775 square feet where 10,000 square feet is required and Article 2841C minimum lot frontage to allow 72.3 feet of frontage where 80 feet is required. And then the second case is 1315 Perkins Street Neighborhood Residential District, Sandra Longfellow and April Woodbury owners, mm -hmm. and they are making a request, for, a similar request for allowing uh, 5,296 5, square foot lot where 10,000 is required, allowing 64.47 frontage where 80 is required, and also uh, allowing forgiveness for the minimum side yard requirements to allow two and a half feet to the westerly property line where 10 feet is required. But that's not on the first one, only on the second. That's right? Yes. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I know you will. <laughs> Would you identify yourself for the record, please? Good evening. My name is Mark Sargent, and I am with the firm of Richard Bartlett and Associates, and I'm here tonight. Uh, representing both applicants. Um, and I don't know, Tracy, have we got a plan? Sorry. My bad. So I'll wait for the plan to come up so it be a little self-explanatory. I can remember my password. You want the plan from your application? Please. One plan, two stores, two, two cases. That's efficiency. <laughs> that's it, yeah. You want a pointer? Sideways, but that's. Uh, now we can do what I do best, turn the lights off. <laughs> oh, that. oh, it's upside down. <laughs> Getting there. Perfect. All right. All right. <clears throat> so the properties are located at 11 and 13 through 15 Perkins Street. Um, 11 is owned by uh, Miss Millette, and uh, 11 or 13 through 15 is owned by Sandra Longfeller and April Wood. What the the two applicants like to do is a lot line adjustment uh, between the two properties. Um, the 11 is, is on the, the right-hand side, 13 through 15 is on the left-hand side. 11 right now has an area of 0.14 acres with 65 feet of frontage, just over 65 feet of frontage. Um, 13 through 15 has 0.12 acres with 71 feet of frontage. So what they're proposing to do, you can see um, that funky lot line between the two properties. It kind of goes off at an angle. And uh, at a, the closest point there to uh, 13 through 15 in the back corner, the, uh, the property line is actually 1.2 feet from the corner of the house. So what they'd like to do is kind of just straighten that line, line out and make it perpendicular to Perkins Street. And what that does is um, causes a net loss of area for 11 of uh, 111 square feet and a net gain of 6.53 feet of frontage. And then on 13 through 15, it's a net gain, obviously, of the one uh, 111 square feet and the loss of the 6.53 reduces the frontage from the 71 to 64.47. And, uh, but it, it allows, it gives a little bit more breathing room uh, for the lot line along the house 
Yeah, so now it's, it's 2.5 feet versus 1.2 feet. It's parallel with the house. Uh, and it just kind of makes uh, just a, a cleaner, cleaner lots out there. So that, that was the intent between the both. So we need uh, variances on 11 to 28.4-1B, uh, which is the minimum lot size. We don't meet it as it exists today. And you know we're reducing it by 111 square feet. Uh, the same with the frontage, um, we, we don't meet it as today. We are adding 6.53 feet of frontage, but we still won't meet the, the minimum requirement. And um, on 11, or excuse me, 13 through 15, we need a variance, again, for the, the lot size. Um, it doesn't meet it, but it is going to be increased by 111 square feet. The frontage um, will be decreased. Uh, but be you know somewhat in compliance or somewhat the same amount of frontage as on the other lots in the neighborhood and uh, in, in this particular case there's a required 10 foot setback um, neither one of the lots you know meet that setback as it exists today by uh, relocating this lot line 11 will meet the required side yard setback um, but obviously 13 through 15 won't. As I mentioned before, right now the back corner is uh, um, 1.2 feet, and the, uh, by moving this, we'll have 2.5 feet. Uh, the front corner, I'll add, currently is uh, about 6 feet. So I did uh, provide, as part of our application, um, Justification for the variances. I can read those verbatim if you'd like, but they're in your package. And we read them. Okay. So if you had any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions from the board? Any questions? What's, yeah. what, what's motivating them to do it? By changing the lot lines, do they have more flexibility uh, to use the property differently? Yeah, that, that gives Nancy. We did the survey for Nancy back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and they didn't realize that 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 lot line was at such a sharp angle. So Nancy had a driveway actually on that side at one point in time. And this just kind of, the, the, the property on the uh, 13 through 15, I, I believe is, is being sold. So this was just presented the okay. perfect opportunity to kind of straighten that lot line out and, okay. and make it on, you know, a, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, I guess, I don't know, but just so it, 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 it it's more what, uh, when you look at it, it's, it's how it's being used. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Great. Sergeant. You're very welcome. Is there anyone who would like to be heard in favor? Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition? Any comments from code enforcement? You've seen these before. When they do a boundary line adjustment, they have to <coughs> seek variances for whatever is going to be nonconforming in the afterlife. So um, it's pretty self explanatory. The afterlife? I had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had no afterlife idea we had such lot. influence. <laughs> Goodness, well, I should have a miter or something if I'm going to sit up here. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Evans. St. Peter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the key, the whole nine yards. <laughs> Mr. Evans. Makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, I'm satisfied. I have no problems. Agreed. The designer in me is desperate to straighten that one. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone care to make a motion? We should take them separately. Uh, Probably, yeah. Yeah, I suppose we should, cases. actually. You're right, we should. We got two cases here. I was thinking uh -huh. two variances, but you're right. Okay, in case uh, 007, oh, 007. Yep. 11 Perkins Street, I'll move to um, approve the um, request. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone care to make a motion on aught, 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 eight? I'll move on um, uh, triple O eight. Uh, 22, 1315 Perkins Street, that we approve the request. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The vote is unanimous. Straighten that line. <laughs> Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next case is uh, SE0001YYYY. 
Don't ask me, because I don't know. 15 Shawmut Street, RN Neighborhood Residential District, CUSD and Eastman School co-owners. The owners wish to provide a part day Head Start and Child Care programs and seek a special exception from Article 28.24J principle of, or table of principal uses. You swear to tell the truth and nothing about it. I do. I do as well. Well, I <laughs> would think nothing, expect nothing less. <laughs> Uh, please identify yourself as you testify and fill us in on what you think we ought to know. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Michael Tabory. Uh, I am the Chief Operating Officer with Community Action Program for Belknap and Merrimack Counties. Uh, you might be familiar with us for fuel assistance, uh, WIC, uh, the Concord Area Transit System, and we also provide Head Start and Early Head Start services as well as a total of close to 70 programs and services throughout the two counties. Uh, this is Heather Patton. She's our child development director at the program. Um, this uh, particular case, um, I'll give you a summary and uh, you can tell me if from there you want me to go through each of the criteria. Uh, so recently, um, due really to need, uh, we've chosen to set up a new um, Head Start, early Head Start Center. Uh, this Eastman School location uh, currently houses boys and, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, and we'd be taking over a portion of the space that they'd been utilizing and no longer use uh, to provide uh, early Head Start and Head Start uh, programming for as many as 16 children. Um, the time frame is between 8.30 and 12.30. Um, we believe it have very minimal impact on the local community uh, as far as anything detrimental. Uh, it's, you know, a residential area around it. Um, it's, you know, this could be light additional traffic. They'll be dropping off children, they'll be picking up children, and there'd probably be three to maximum of probably four staff employed in that location. If you like, I can go through the rest of the criteria. What does the board say? Do you, we have read the application. Do you want to hear the criteria? No, no we read it. I think we, unless there's something that's not in your app that you think we ought to know. I don't believe so. I think so. so this was um, Boys and Girls Club used this on a temporary basis where they were doing construction and they actually came here uh, several years ago, didn't they? Or perhaps you don't recall. So most of what the neighborhood is used to what's going on. Uh, I'm sorry? The neighborhood is very used to what's taking place on the property. Okay. Uh, Boys and Girls Club will still be there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just taking up a portion of the space that they have not been utilizing. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why they, if the Boys and Girls Club is there, do they, why do they even need another special exception? Because isn't it already being so used So the this? Boys and Girls Club was granted a temporary Oh. And um, this is more child care than what the Boys and Girls Club does, and child care is defined as a special exception, exception in this district. While the school use is permitted, this is literally child care is a special exception in this district. So because they're adding that I see. aspect to it, it does require the permit. Okay. I think child care is a special exception in all districts, isn't it? Okay. I'd have to look. Yeah. It, in further uh, support, of this, one could argue that Head Start and Early Head Start is educational, um, even more so than child care. But not having seen that use, and there is a, I don't know if child care, it, it, we tend to blend them, you know. What's Head Start, the, Early Head Start, and child care blended in our programming. What, what's the ages? So the classroom that we're going to have at Eastman is only preschool age and it is a school year classroom versus child care is typically a full day type of program which is what the boys and girls club currently have but we're only looking for part day and so ages is six weeks to five years old head start so it's preschool okay so three and so four. three to kindergarten sounds like a rowdy crowd <laughs> 
just Did a you? new program. <laughs> You're not volunteering. So it was a, this particular classroom, um, or I would, should say these funded spots were originally in Warner, but based upon the um, community assess needs that Community Action Program did last year, um, the it warrants that the greater need for our community is in Concord, so rather than where we were in Warner. Any other questions from the board? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard in favor of this appeal? You did get a letter in favor. Oh, I did. Is there more than one in the email? I think it was the one on, at your table. It was, it was very brief. It was from Suzanne Smith-Meyer at 14 Chomet Street, um, who is in full support of granting the special exception because um, it's a great match and use of the building, mm -hmm. uh, much like the school was and an asset to the neighborhood. And she hopes to meet you in person. <laughs> she still has playing board. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that will declare the public testimony portion of the hearing closed. And I will invite Mr. Winters to dive into this tough one. Well, you know, on this, the special exception criteria, go, and we did look at it, but it, it really goes to the, the, the burden on, on town resources. And um, this is this building's historically be used, been used in a very similar function for you know for a long, long time. So it doesn't seem to really change the, the impact in any way. So I, I you know would be inclined to approve. I agree with Andrew. Same. Sure. Likewise. I feel the same. I think the same too. Would anyone care to make a motion? I'll move to approve the special exception. Is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The vote is unanimous. The special exception is granted. That brings us to case triple, you're welcome, triple zero nine, 2022. 58 Pleasant Street, CVP, Civic Performance District, known as Parking Realty LLC owner. The owner wishes to convert a professional office building to a two-family dwelling and request variances to Article 2857A to allow residential conversion on a lot comprised of 3,223 square feet, where a lot size of 7,500 square feet with 5,000 square feet buildable area is required, and Article 2872E <coughs> off-street parking requirements to allow for a reduction in the required parking from four to one. Mr. Hastings, you swear to tell the truth and nothing about it. I do. Could you identify yourself for the record, please? Yes, my name is Philip Hastings. I'm an attorney with Cleveland Waters and Baths. I represent uh, known as uh, Parking Realty LLC, the owner of this property. What would you like us to know? Uh, we submitted an application uh, to you for uh, a couple of variances, although I'm not sure uh, a variance is really required for the parking. Um, this is a uh, unusual situation. The property is located at uh, 58 Pleasant Street, which is at the corner of uh, Federal and Pleasant Street. It was uh, formerly used as a law office. Um, I suspect it was used at one time as a residence, uh, given the design and history of the, of the building itself. I don't know that for sure. Um, is, is, that, is it Paul Maggiato's old office? Yes, That's correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, it's across from the uh, federal uh, courthouse. Uh, it's in a mixed use uh, district. There's uh, other office buildings there. It's next to uh, restaurant property, residential property. Uh, it's located in the CVP district, which permits a variety of uses. Um, my client uh, uh, is not interested in continuing the office use of the property. Um, he would like to uh, convert the building to a two-family dwelling. Uh, it's uh, physically situated very well for a two-family uh, dwelling. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Oh, and in the CVP district, two-family dwellings are permitted as a right, uh, so we don't need a, a use variance here. Uh, through um, what I would consider a quirk of the zoning ordinance, 
uh, this is treated as a conversion of a, a office use to a residential use and in the CVP district, even though there's no uh, specific lot size requirement for properties uh, in the CVP district, conversions to residential use uh, do require lot sizes of 700, uh, 7,500 square feet. The lot size here is just over 3,000 square feet. So on that basis, the change of use is really what's rendering uh, this property non-conforming. Um, the salient facts um, justifying a variance is that the property is in a mixed-use district. Um, it's an existing property, and we're not creating a new lot. Uh, the use is reasonable given the unique condition of the property and its location. The size of the lot is reasonable for its use. Many other properties in this district of similar uses have similar lot sizes. Uh, it will not alter the essential characteristics of the neighborhood. Uh, it will benefit the public by, uh, albeit in a small way, by converting a res uh, an office use to a residential use, so adding uh, two new units to the housing stock in Concord. Um, and without the variance, uh, my client would have to continue a use that uh, he doesn't consider viable for the property. Um, housing in this area is uh, the most viable and highest and best use. Um, so substantial justice would be done, and it would be in the uh, public interest uh, to grant the variance uh, for the uh, reduced lot size. Um, the uh, Parking uh, variance uh, request um, is related to the fact, again, that we're converting from a residential uh, office use to a residential use. Um, under uh, an office use, uh, this property would require nine parking spaces, off-street parking spaces. Um, that's based on one, uh, one space for per 300 square feet of use. There's a little bit over uh, 2,700 square feet of office use according to the tax records. Um, but in fact, there's only one space um, on site here. Um, so it's uh, already a non-conforming use in terms of the parking requirements. Uh, the residential use requires two spaces per unit, um, so we're reducing the non-conformity uh, uh, from uh, where one is, nine is required, uh, one is provided to now a situation where four is required and one is provided. My client's working on uh, trying to see if he can uh, relocate, there's a uh, utility pole uh, right next to the spot uh, on Federal Street, the existing off-street parking spot. If he can uh, get the utility company to relocate the pole, he might be able to get two spaces um, on site, which would be ideal for, for two uh, dwelling units. Uh, it would be ideal to have two spaces. Um, but right now, we're just dealing with what we, what we have. Um, the change in use... Uh, uh, will uh, make the property less non-conforming. Uh, and in this area, the, I think as uh, Dr. Hutton noted in her memo, uh, there is predominantly uh, on-street parking in that entire uh, area of the city. So it would not be out of character uh, to require on-street uh, on parking instead of off-street parking spaces. That's all I have. Questions for Mr. Hastings? Any questions? Jim? No. What is the parking easement that's shown on the plan? The parking easement shown on the plan, uh, right now the current conditions, um, the property line, uh, the parking from the adjoining property, uh, we 
which is known as oh, restaurant and spring court condominium, that parking encroaches over the property line. Okay. Um, so the, to straighten out that issue, uh, we would probably uh, do some sort of parking easement. So that's why it's shown on the plan. It's really not relevant to the two variances requested. Well, I'm wondering if it might be relevant because if, when I assume when the restaurants closed, those parking spaces would be open for the residents to use? Um, it, it's possible. Uh, this condominium has the five, uh, five condominiums yep. um, on uh, North Spring Street. Yep. They use that parking area, there's oh, dedicated parking uh, in the carport. Um, so we don't want to necessarily impinge on any of their parking rights in terms of access, although that might be a solution uh, to get a second, at least a second parking spot. The only, the only difference I see in the, in the, it's a similar amount of spots required for residential versus the office workers, but you know, office workers, you know, they can rent off-site off parking and walk, kind of like the, the workers at the federal court. That's probably what the law office was doing before. They must have had some arrangement because they wouldn't have all been able to park on the street there. In fact, I'm not even, I don't even, the parking in- It's only on one side. Uh, yeah, there's bare, there's, that's, I don't know, there might be two hour or one hour parking on Pleasant Street there. It's very limited parking on the Pleasant Street. So like, wh where's, where's he thinking of, these residents are really going to park overnight. Uh, the the standard has been one parking spot per unit. Um, that's what's uh, provided at the Spring Corner site, for example. There's only one spot per per dwelling unit. Um, so folks who reside in one of the dwelling units, if we're not able to provide a second spot, would have to find alternative parking. Else, elsewhere on the street. It's it's not an ideal s situation, but it's no worse than the existing office use. Other questions? That metered parking? Is it metered parking? Or not? On the street? I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I believe on Pleasant Street it is metered parking. I'm not sure what it is on Federal Street or what parking exists on Federal Street? I believe on Pleasant Street there, it's, I mean, it made, it's, it's metered maybe an hour or two hours because it's right across from the court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone here who wishes to be heard in favor of this appeal or in opposition to it? Comments from code enforcement. Yeah, the only additional comment I wanted to make about the parking is that um, I talked to General Services. This is in the winter maintenance parking ban area, so where um, generally people in offices don't park overnight. These uh, residents would obviously want to park overnight, and that presents a problem with that winter parking maintenance area. That Do was my only. Are garages open during the winter parking maintenance? I don't know about the garages. I do know yeah. that the streets yeah. are completely yeah. off limits. Okay. But the garages are. Yeah, I think it's typically recommended that they you park in the garage. Yeah, yeah. I think downtown residents are kind of. Yeah. It does pres <laughs> pre present a further strain. And the, oh, the other comment I wanted to make is if they do seek an alternative parking arrangement, that is a conditional use. <coughs> oh, you mean with a related entity? Okay. Yeah. But that doesn't. That's not our worry. It is not. I did. That's what I yeah. wanted yeah. to okay. say. Yeah. yeah. All right. They would need an additional approval from a different board if that was what they were seeking. Mm -hmm. Well, Thank there's you. other boards. <laughs> don't care about them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll declare the public testimony portion of the hearing closed. I invite conversation on the subject of this request, starting over with Mr. Monahan. Nope. Yeah, I, no, I think there's no question. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to go first? Oh, I, I agree with Ted. <laughs> <laughs> and Ted just sighed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no question. This building was a very was, was a designed as a residential building. Um, it comes back and forth. Given the need for additional housing, I think it's a productive use of it. Um, um, it I think it's up to the business, the, the um, property owner to figure out the parking piece. I think 
at least be, they want to move a utility pole, so good luck. But they're at least making an effort. And it's really up to them to find renters that are willing to, to rent without the park provider. Like relocating a volcano. Mm -hmm. Laura. Uh, I would have no problem with either variance. I think that neither of them would alter the essential character of the neighborhood because I agree with Jim. It was obviously built as a house. Um, I think that, and the parking problem exists. I think it will not diminish surrounding property values uh, and substantial justice would be done despite the fact that it's a reduced lot size. And I think the property is unique given the existing structure and the existing parking. So I would have no problem granting either variance. Andrew. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have a concern about the parking, be, but I think I can get over it. Um, it's, it, you know, it's not like a situation where you're adding parking in an area that's going to be overflowing above the neighbors because the, the parking is terrible for everyone here anyway, and this adding four more units is pretty pretty minimal compared to the yeah. total situation. Or two, two units, units, I'm sorry. Theoretically, four cars. Theoretically, four cars. is It's not good, but it's min I mean, the parking's bad no matter what in this area. Surprised he doesn't tear it down and build a parking garage. <laughs> Very good. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, it seems to me that any permitted use here is going to require some forgiveness. This is just swapping one for another. In some ways, it's less of an impact. Anyone care to make a motion? I make a motion that we approve both requested variances. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The vote is unanimous. The variances are granted. And that brings us, I believe, you're welcome. Uh, that brings us to our last case on the agenda this evening, 010 2022 388 Loudon Road, Gateway Performance District. Jeremy Martinson wishes to relocate his transmission shop and seeks a variance to Article 2824J, Table of Principal Uses, to allow use J4. J, J4, automotive repair, service, and towing, excluding bodywork, at this location. You both swear to tell the truth and nothing but. I do. I do. Please identify yourselves for the record as you testify. Uh, my name is Allison McGregor. I'm an attorney with Orrin Reno. Um, we're here to represent Jeremy Martinson. And I'm Jeremy Martinson, owner operator of Amco. So we're here to request a variance for permit uh, change in use um, to be able to permit his auto repair facility, his Amco transmission business, to move from 234 Loudon Road up to 388 Loudon Road. So it's currently located in the Gateway Performance District. Um, just moving, as you can see, up Loudon Road there. So I'm going to let um, Jeremy kind of give a little bit of background really quickly on his business and just kind of what Amco is like. Yeah, basically I've been in the business since I graduated college, uh, about 15 years. I was hired by Amco at that location, um, started as a manager in training, became a manager, became a general manager, now I'm the owner operator. I take a lot of pride in what I do. Um, we're the number one Amco in the Northeast. Um, uh, the biggest issue that I face right now as an owner operator in Concord is the, is the parking, the flow of the parking. Um, we share the parking lot with Valvoline. Um, so Valvoline's made it clear that they would rather not have uh, another repair facility next to them. They would rather just operate independently without us there. I've been actively searching for another location for the business for several years. Um, there is no current listings on property available on Manchester Street or Loudon Road other than the Red Apple Buffet on the corner. Uh, so I've really been, um, you know, researching and investing and in time into to trying to find a property where the, the traffic is, is more feasible for the business that we have. Um, as a member of the community and a member of, you know, my business, I strive to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Um, you know, I participate in, you know, uh, sponsoring sports programs and uh, we work with churches and stuff like that. But... More or less, we're here uh, to, to essentially move the business not far, just down the street, and hopefully, um, you know, just, just relocate. What's on the property now? Uh, currently, the property that we're looking to re relocate is there was a, like, uh, rundown biker bar there. Um, so it doesn't look like much was reinvested in that property in a long time. 
Um, so currently it's just, it was a restaurant that, like I said, I mean, there was some complaints I've gathered from, from uh, local residents and neighbors um, that it wasn't ideal for, you know, uh, the area. So I, I have approached the, the two neighbors, Chapel Tractor, and there's a law firm next door, and they both have given me their approval that they'd really like to see it repurposed, a uh, new state-of-the-art, you know, repair facility, obviously, versus what it is now and what it's been, which is this, you know, this biker bar that, you know, it's just kind of this uh, eyesore, so to speak. Yeah, so if I can just kind of orient you, there's 393 is just north of there, so that's all the interchanges trying to get on to 393 mm -hmm. there. Um, Chapel Tractor is the one directly across from the lot, um, across Loudon Road. And then, obviously, you have about a quarter mile of, like, minimally developed land before you hit kind of the core of the Gateway Performance District. So, as you mentioned, the site's currently, the building's vacant. Um, it was previously a restaurant there. Um, kind of jumping around in our discussion here a little bit, but that kind of goes right to our hardship argument is that there is, you know, when we're looking at types of businesses that can survive and thrive in this area, um, being located right across from Chapel Tractor, which is a current non-conforming use in this area as well, um, being located so close to 393, we find that those restaurants just didn't survive there. Um, we'd see probably similar problems with a small retail business just because they don't receive the same amount of traffic that you know those businesses kind of rely on. Those are being done more in the core part of the Gateway Performance District. Um, but it's also only a two acre lot, so you're not going to see you know one of those big box stores or your big grocery stores come in and take over this lot, and that's why we're seeing it set kind of unused right now. So when we're looking at kind of you know the spirit of the ordinance and what's there, we want to see it be you know attractive gateway to our community. Um, we want to see it be functional, um, and that's not currently what it is doing there. Um, the other thing that's important is that he is currently in the Gateway Performance District, looking to just move. To the, this is probably the furthest, I don't know if you can show like the overlays, but it's the northernmost point of the Gateway Performance District here. Um, so when we're talking about the gateway to the downtown area, he's actually taking an auto repair facility and moving it further up and further north um, in the area. So I can jump through the criteria if you would like me to. I think those were honestly some of our main points um, right there. I know we're looking at kind of a late hour here and you guys have been hearing a lot of cases. Um, one thing I do want to talk about, because he spoke about parking, but just kind of traffic congestion in general on Loudoun Road is obviously an issue. Um, when we look to kind of the public health, public safety, the welfare of the community, um, where he's at right now, there's really no traffic slowing measures when people come in and out of the Valvoline, the AMCO facility that's there. So, you know, you're trying to make a left turn across Loudoun Road, you're accelerating into these places, you're accelerating across the sidewalks. When you come to this spot here, you're seeing a lot more of just kind of like natural traffic slowing conditions. There's concrete medians that don't allow direct left-hand turns in and out of or across Loudoun. Um, so you're actually seeing an increase in public safety by having the, you know, a car-centered business be moved outside of that core area. Um, so that's kind of character of locality. Like we said, it's the chapel tractor across the street. We're not going to see it dr drastically change. Um, substantial justice, uh, his business is doing very well. He needs a new place to be able to grow and expand, um, as well as just kind of be able to be accessed by customers more easily. Um, this site allows for that while not preventing any you know, public harm. So I think substantial justice is done. The value of the past surrounding properties is not diminished. Um, once again, Chapel Tractor is an existing non-conforming use that's there. Um, they've expressed that they are in support of this. The law office that's directly um, north of the facility has also written a letter and we've submitted it to you guys. I think you had it in your seats this mo or when you arrived. Felt like this morning, but no. Um, we do have the letter. Yes, so the letter is here um, showing that support. So um, the surrounding property values we just don't think would be diminished, especially considering the prior businesses that were there experienced probably louder noise complaints, more traffic at later hours, things like that. But um, at that point, I guess Mr. Mertensen has proven to be a really successful business owner, um, even with competitors located quite close. Moving this existing business from the core of the Gateway Performance District to a northern boundary site would be beneficial not only to him, but to the district as a whole. 
Um, you pair it with an existing non-conforming use. We're redeveloping an underutilized property, um, freeing space in the core of the district, reducing congestion, increasing driver and pedestrian safety, and positively contributing to the goal and maintaining an attractive gateway to our city. So we're asking that you grant the variance for section 2824J, allowing an auto repair facility at 388 Loudon Road. Questions? Is the other property behind it there, like that third piece of property, is that just vacant? Where that might be? Uh, let me look at the plan. Do you know what that was? The big chunk. Yeah, the there. big chunk in the back. Yeah, that's, va that's, that's vacant. vacant. I think they've been trying to sell, sell that for some time, but that is vacant. Huh. There's no structure on that? I don't believe so. There's no, no structure on it. Huh. Other questions? What kind of volume do you do, like, relative to, say, like, Jiffy Lube or something like that? So our car count's about uh, 30 to 40 cars a week. Oh. So it's not tons and tons, uh, bigger repairs, transmissions, engines, stuff like that. Okay, so you're not doing like that many oil changes inspections? We, don't, we, we honestly don't do state inspections and we don't do oil changes. So you mainly do Ours is, you know, it's the transmission, the most complex, you know, item on the car, we're, we're, that's that's what we want to do, drivetrain, you know, the big jobs essentially, but, you know, the high volume oil changes and all that stuff is not really our our uh, our business model. So you're keeping cars for, for a few days at a time? Yeah, actually. exactly. Right. Yep. And that's where the, the parking is a, an important aspect, and I always tell people that, you know, unlike a Jiffy Lube or a brake and muffler shop where they're in and out the same day, we're taking a transmission out. Essentially, the transmission has to come apart, has to be rebuilt. We have that car for three to five days. So obviously, there's other you know limitations and challenges with parts and stuff like that since COVID. But um, that's where you know granting this would be would be great, just because of you know the the, the uh, constraints we have with the with the, the flow, of the traffic, and the parking now. Is the current location non-conforming, or was there a variance? The current the current location was, I would have to look to be honest, I'm not sure what the history of that facility is. It would be non-conforming as of now, but I don't know if it was grandfathered in as a. Other questions from the board? Is this where the old Speedway gas station was, or is this? No, that's Jimmy's Seafood Restaurant, or Pit Road Lounge, as it was known. Oh, Pit Road Speedway Lounge. was not on that property. And where's the where's the Valvoline place that you mentioned in relation? Right next door to to us, uh, so just down the street, two thirty four Loudon Road. So if you go down Loudon Road, like you're going back to the city, probably half a mile, a mile. It's one mile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to the left, you can see Valvoline. So you can see, I mean, it's less than an acre. Um, we're both about a four thousand square foot building each. Um, they're they're doing a lot more traffic than we are. I mean, they're the oil changes, they're the quick tickets in and out. So, the so we're going from just to give the board night. We're going from here up to here. Right. Is the entire length of Loudon Road there all the gateway performance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank you very much. Would anyone like to be heard in favor or in opposition to this appeal? Comments from code enforcement. No, I gave the surrounding uses on your memo just so you had a sense of what was on there. And again, this was going to require further planning board review. So very good. Well, that will declare the public testimony portion of the hearing closed. I'll invite uh, discussion. This time we'll start with Mr. Evans. I think it meets all the criteria. And I'm willing to approve. Um, I agree with Ted again. All right. I'm struggling with the hardship. I don't see how it's different from any other property in the Gateway Performance District. Just because it's better than what's there doesn't make it unique. Andrew. I'm surprised that this isn't allowed in the Gateway Performance just because there are, like they said, at least three other auto body shop, or repair shops, plus there's like granite glass, there's seems like a few other related type of activity down there and it seems pretty characteristic with the, with the neighborhood so I'd be inclined to approve I uh, I also be inclined to approve I think you can make an argument uh, that the location of the property 
creates problems for some of the permitted uses, but not for this particular use uh, with the traffic and its proximity to the highway, and we heard testimony of that sort. So I think based on that, I'd be willing to support a motion to grant the, uh, to grant the variances. Is it two or one? One. One. Grant the variance. Anyone care to make a motion? I'll move it to approve um, the variance to Article 28.24J, Table of Principal Uses, to allow the use of the automotive repair. Second. Anyone care a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. The vote is four to one. Laura is in the minority on this one. <laughs> and that concludes our agenda for this evening. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes from last last month? So moved. Is there a second? I, I second. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Four votes and an abstention. I think we got it. I was ready for him to come up and anything else that we need to talk about again tonight, Dr. Hutton. All right, in that case. I like the starting at six thing. David thought you might.